A very good morning and welcome to the 32nd meeting of the Criminal Justice Committee in 2024. We have no apologies this morning and our first agenda item is to welcome Liam Kerr to the committee as our new member and can I invite Liam to declare any interests relevant to the work of the Criminal Justice Committee? Yes, thank you, Kavina. Good morning. Uh, I do have an interest to declare, which I shall flag up specifically at each session where it's relevant, because it won't always be relevant. But uh, just by way of reminder, remind the committee that I am a practising solicitor uh, and I hold practising certificates with the Law Society of England and Wales and with the Law Society of Scotland. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and that brings us on to our next item of business, which is the selection of a new deputy convener. So the Parliament has agreed that only members of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party are eligible for nomination as deputy convener of this committee. Uh, I understand that Liam Kerr is that party's nominee for the post, and I invite members to agree that we appoint Liam as our new deputy convener. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. So congratulations, Liam, on your appointment, and we look forward to working with you. Do you want to say anything? Uh, only that would have been awkward if everyone hadn't agreed to that. <laughs> um, I'm delighted to be back, of course, um, and actually very pleased actually very pleased to see so many familiar faces uh, and expertise on the panel. It's, uh, it's going to be uh, very enjoyable. I'm delighted to be here. Super. Thank you very much. Okay, so our next item of business is to just to confirm with the committee uh, to agree to take items six and seven in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you. So our next item of business is to continue our pre-budget scrutiny. And our focus today is on policing, and we have two panels of witnesses. Our first panel consists of representatives of Police Scotland, and I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, the Chief Constable, Joe Farrell, uh, Deputy Chief Constable, Jay Connors, uh, and Mr James Gray, uh, Chief Financial Officer. So welcome to you all, and I refer members to papers one and two. So I intend to allow around 75 minutes for this panel. So I'll begin by asking the Chief Constable to make some opening remarks and then we'll move on to questions. Chief Constable. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Committee. We welcome the opportunity to discuss Police Scotland's budget requirements and long-term direction today. The key elements of our joint budget request with the SPA to Scottish Government are, to set out in the written, are set out in the written submission which was provided to the committee last week. And in summary, there are three key elements I would want the committee members to take full account of. Firstly, our revenue and reform funding proposals, all rooted in enabling the delivery of our three-year plan and moving us towards a multi-year funding and investment approach. Secondly, the need for a new approach to capital investment that draws on multiple sources of funding, these being our grant from Scottish Government, the reinvestment of um, capital receipts, and critically, the use of existing statutory borrowing powers that have not been utilised before, but which are absolutely essential to long-term investment planning. Lastly, and equally important is the need for a facility to hold reserves to allow us to plan and invest effectively over the long term. Discussions with Scottish Government are ongoing across all of these areas and with the Chancellor delivering her budget today, we look forward to the outcome of the Scottish Government funding considerations in the coming weeks. As I said to the committee when I met you in September, strengthening and protecting the front line of policing is a central priority under my leadership. I've made that clear since I took up my role a little, a little over a year ago. I'm pleased to be able to say today that I anticipate that we will reach 16,600 full-time equivalent officers within the next week. This strengthening of our workforce has been a real achievement for our recruitment and training teams, and I want to recognise that today. Officer full-time equivalent numbers is an accessible shorthand for pol policing capacity, and one which is constantly fluctuating through recruitment and levers. 
So the position today is a, a more up-to-date than the quarterly statistics, which will reflect levels at the end of September. What is equally important, though, is the number of experienced officers performing frontline operational policing for our communities and how we give those officers the best services and support to do their job. That's why our strategic direction focuses on strengthening policing's front line and reconnecting with communities. I presented our 2030 vision and three-year plan to the SPA at the most recent public meeting and was pleased with the strength of support and endorsement we received for these. When I took up my role as Chief Constable, I said that I wanted to simplify the way in which, in which Police Scotland plans and prioritises now and in the future, and we have now done that. I would encourage members of the committee who haven't had the chance to read the 2030 vision and the three-year business plan to consider the commitments we have now made to improving our organisation and the service we deliver to Scottish communities. I also said that I would work hard to secure the long-term investment from government that we need to achieve the, long, the, the vision and the long-term plan. As I said in my written submission, policing in Scotland represents major and successful sector reform. Much has been achieved since 2013. The next phase of Scottish policing reform will see us reshape Police Scotland and work to realise our 2030 vision of safer communities, less crime, better supported victims and a thriving workforce. Scottish Government committed last year to the next phase of the reform journey with the revenue budget settlement for this current year. And we are seeking continued commitment from the Government to that journey with our 2025-26 budget proposals. My message to Police Scotland colleagues has been clear. I'm focused and working hard to secure the funding we need, and I expect to see from them a relentless focus on delivery, quality in every part of our business, improvement in our performance and impact, meaningful commitment to continuous improvement and best value. And I want to op us to operate as one team, police officers, police staff and volunteers, all pulling in the same direction. I would finish my opening remarks by drawing particular attention again to our proposal that Police Scotland and the SPA are supported to adopt a more appropriate future funding arrangement to support our long-term planning and investment. I believe we need to move to a multi-year funding commitment from Scottish Government. I want us to be able to exercise statutory borrowing powers to support our ambition investment, ambitious investment plans, particularly across our estate. And I want to see the establishment of a facility to be able to carry forward the carry forward of financial reserves. I've worked in this way in other forces, and I think it is fundamental to effectively managing our service. We will always operate in a dynamic environment, managing new and changing threat, risk and harm. But we need long-term planning and financial stability to better prepare for the future. I also believe that our established track record of excellence in operational and financial planning and management offers assurance that Police Scotland is ready to work in this way. I'm seeking, to, seeking support from across political parties for this approach, as well as for our long-term vision and three-year plan. And I hope to be able to secure the support of this committee for our budget proposals for next year. Thank you, convener. Myself and my colleagues are happy to take any questions. Th thank you very much, Chief Constable. That's very helpful. Um, so I'll open up questions to members. As usual, I'll come in, if I may, with the first question, um, and it's um, with regard to capital funding. So in your comprehensive submission, you indicate that you require capital funding of £83 million to deliver your basic rolling replacement uh, programme of things like fleet systems uh, equipment. And you also set out a capital investment requirement in the longer term uh, of around 565 million. That would be up to 2029. And you also indicate how 
investing in areas such as new technology, new technologies, um, improved working conditions, uh, equipment, uh, really leads to more efficiency within uh, the service in terms of, in particular, delivery uh, to the public. So in other words, there's a sort of spend to save benefit here. I wonder if you can just provide a bit more detail on what these benefits would be uh, and what would be the impact of not receiving the increased capital investment that you've set out? Thank you, and thank you, thank you for the for the question. Um, so, in relation to the proposals for for next year, as you said, there's um, detail there in terms of estate, um, ongoing rolling uh, investment around technology and uh, digital capability, in addition to fleet. And um, we know that in relation to the opportunities um, that are presented in relation to further digitalisation of the organisation, not only does that provide us with um, the tools to be more effective as a, a policing service and to ensure that we keep communities safe, reduce crime and um, support victims, but at the same time it also makes us more efficient and it takes us both into the arena of uh, replacing existing uh, technology that exists, uh, for, for example, um, upgrading and replacing the um, systems that we have in our command and control rooms, so the people that answer the 999 and, and 101, 101 calls, and using the advances in technology to be able to more, work in a more efficient, inefficient way. In addition to that, we want to explore issues such as automation. So you point around spending, spending to save, so we're able to do routine um, tasks in a more efficient way so that we can then use our resources, our human resources, to ensure that we um, are more effective as a, as a policing service. Um, I'll, bring, I'll bring James in in a minute, um, convener, because you've, you've detailed uh, quite a lot of the, of, of the, um, the details in terms of, of the financial figures. But just to move, move to, the, to the estate, um, so key um, message from me today to the committee is that our approach in relation to the way in which we've managed our estate um, through the uh, first 10, 11 years of Police Scotland has very much been on a, a rolling repair um, arrangement, and, and and that also you know had its had its benefits and um, had its day, and that day is now is now over. So um, we need to moving forward be in a position where we can uh, invest in our estate and move away from repair, 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 because we're now repairing the repairs. And when I was here last month, we talked about officer welfare and we talked about a thriving workforce and some of the estate in which uh, our people are working in um, is quite frankly appalling um, and doesn't in any way portray the image of this organisation as one that can be trusted to deliver communities or give our people the right environment to feel as though they're being, being cared for. But as I said in my opening, this will need to be a shift in the way that the money is allocated so that we can plan what the estate five, ten years from now looks like. Now, we've done that work. We've done that thinking. We've, we've, um, we've um, looked at it both from the financial requirements but also from, obviously, the operational requirements. And this is everything from co-locating um, local policing in communities to buildings for our officers to work for, particularly um, in relation to the equipment that's needed by response officers in the year 2024 and beyond. And then things like our custody provision, really important in terms of keeping people safe um, who are detained and that we have a responsibility. But as I say, this will need a different approach and I'll, I'll ask James to talk in detail in relation to that. I can just ask you... Mm. I think there's quite a lot to cover um, and, and, and so fairly succinct responses would be helpful because I know members are wanting to come in with a range of questions. 
Yes, thank you, Convener. Um, I think it is fair to say that this has got a very strong spend-to-save element, so I'll just focus on one quick example. It's on the estate, given that that represents almost half of that capital ask over the five years. Our estate is, is too big and, and it's inefficient. And when I say it's too big, I don't mean we've got too many locations put necessarily. It's more about the size of buildings and what the purpose of them was when they were built. So Randall Field in Stirling. Of course, we need to have a policing presence in Stirling, but do we need the building that was the former headquarters of Central Scotland Police that's got custody that's not used, it's got C3, it's got force executive facilities, when actually what it needs is a, is a local policing police station. And, and that's an example of cost of maintaining something that isn't actually fit for what we need. And, and, and that's one example I could pick many across the country. The other is around inefficiency. Our estate is very old. When you look at our EPC, you know, energy performance certificates, most of our buildings are, are, are below E, which is, is very poor. So our utilities costs are, are really significant. So actually, this investment in the estate to move away from just patching up failing buildings towards getting better quality right-sized facilities in the communities that are energy efficient, that over a 10-year period, our initial estimations are that we could save £15 million a year of cashable savings. And that was why in the submission we said we could afford to borrow the money and repay it from those savings and still make an overall savings contribution. Thanks. Thank you for that. That's really helpful. I wonder if we can just bring in, um, if I may, I'm just going to move on to other members because I know there's a lot to, to cover and we are limited for time. So with that, I'll bring in Liam Kerr. I'm very grateful, Gavina. Good morning <laughs> to the panel. Uh, Chief Constable, I'll move to the resource budget, uh, if I may. The Scottish Government asked you to model two scenarios, one in which you receive a flat cash settlement and one in which there is a 3% cash reduction. In your submission, you said that a flat cash settlement means that the numbers, the officer numbers could drop to 15,100 and 3% would drop below 15,000. Uh, how inevitable, first of all, is that such that if the budget shows, for example, flat cash, are those numbers what we're going to see by March 2026? Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll respond to that, but I, I'd also um, ask DCC Connors to come in in relation to the point about what's, what would be the impact of a reduction, or reduction in, 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 in the workforce. So in relation to the modelling of the, of, of, the two, of the two scenarios, um, that that would be that would be the the projected impact of the the revenue budget not being able to support the current the current levels um and police scotland has a a long history in terms of strong financial planning and linking that planning to to the workforce um so i am confident that 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 you know that would we, that would be the impact should we not should we not receive um, sufficient uh, revenue to support um, the workforce numbers that we that we currently that we currently have? There's a broader there's a broader point uh, to be to be made um, in in what we've we've detailed in the, in the document, in that we have a, an ability to turn police officer numbers on and off quite quickly. What we don't have is the ability to do that with our police staff. And I've said a couple of times at this committee, um, I would um, want us to talk more broadly about, this is 22,000 people who all deliver policing for the people of Scotland. And very much the effect of that workforce is to keep people safe, reduce crime support victims and it's very much as i've said in the submission where we need to be talking in the future um in the sense of you know asking the chief constable asking me to keep the people of scotland safe providing a budget that is both uh, realistic uh, in terms of, of that um in the context of of the broader um economic situation in the com in the country but talking about the effect of 22,000 people because um, this is a mixed and diverse diverse workforce and I also say in the submission there is some opportunity to change the mix of that workforce and that's something that we've started to explore two things um, it provides a, mm, 
because I do want to come back on the impact, and I think mm. the point, if I may say, yes. is well made. Uh, and I will ask a, a question to DCC Connors in a second. But could you advise, just in relation to the the, the projections, the flat cash and three percent, there's pay claims going on. Uh, can you advise where we are on that on this current settlement of those pay claims? And in any event, what impact could any such settlement have? on the projections that you've made for the flat cash in the 3% by March 2026? We'll, we'll respond to that. James will pick um, that, that up and then we'll talk about impact of, of, of reduction in, in, in numbers. Thank you. So the, the resource ask is, is based on an assumption about the settlement in, in this year's pay award, as, as you rightly point out, and, th and that is the figure that has been made in public now, about the 4.75%. Anything over and above that would uh, uh, would represent an additional pressure over and above what we have in these figures here today and then obviously we've got an assumption in the ask for next year based on public sector pay policy and what that would look like in relation to us so you're right if if, if you if your question was around could a settlement a pay award settlement this year create additional pressure into next year's budget then the answer is yes if if the settlement ended up being in excess of the 4.75 percent uh, one final question then from me, which I'll direct to DCC Connors, but Chief Constable, of course, uh, come in if, if, if you wish. Uh, DCC Connors, last year the SPF told this committee that cuts to any cuts to numbers would, and I quote this, uh, have consequences and public safety could be compromised. And they went on to say the police service cannot cope with any further reduction of officer numbers. So if numbers were to drop, as uh, has been suggested they could in certain situations in your submission, what impact would that have on the force's ability to provide the services it does? So thank you very much for the question. And I will link it a little bit, if I can, to the capital and the benefits, because I, I do think it, it all links in. And I absolutely understand the Federation comments. Policing is around th managing threat, harm and risk, which we do every single day. We have to make choices around some of the, the, the lower impact volume crime versus some of the, the, the higher levels threat, harm and risk. If we do see a reduction and we see a reduction in police officer numbers and equivalent police staff, then we have to review how we deliver our services and where those services are, are, are put in. So at the moment, with the vision that Police Scotland has got, the business plan and the process that we're going through to try and make sure that we have a strategic workforce planning process which means we're looking at demand, we're looking at resource and we're looking at service delivery. We want to be able to put our resources into the right place and be able to do that in a strategic mechanism. If we don't have the funding that we need to be able to do that, we will then have to start falling back to say, where are the officers and the staff going to be put? Which is not a strategic way of doing it. It means that we have to make those difficult choices much more quickly without the longer term view. In terms of, of, of public safety, we are always public safety focused. We will always base on threat, harm and risk. We will manage criticality, critical incidents. We manage operational policing. So, so I don't think public safety would be compromised because we're a police service. Would it mean that we have to prioritise and make more difficult choices around the threat, harm and risk? It would. One of the key things that we've been looking at, and it links to the benefits and the capital, is the community policing model. Because being able to do problem solving and prevention by investing in our community policing model means that we are able to get ahead of some of the issues by tackling root causes with our partners. So we're not constantly reacting as a police service to the demands that come in, but we're able to strategically, as an organisation, look at how we support our communities, support our victims, and then be able to move forward. So that is a key element that we're actually doing that work, work would have to be accelerated and would be very difficult if we do get the reduction in numbers. If I could just touch on the capital, the point of the capital and the benefits and the impacts, which was the original question, is around us being able to create capacity in our workforce. We know the criminal justice system places pressures on officers, mental health, there's a number of different factors. Being able to create capacity either through automation, through our modernising contact where calls come into the call centres, but actually we have digital mechanisms to reduce some of that call demand. We look at some of our digital planning with our online and we're able to deal much better with the online crime. 
we have data which actually enables us then to look at intelligence, how our data processes work, so we can be much more intelligent, intelligent about where we're putting our threat, harm and risk. So when we talk about capital, it's those areas that need the capital investment because the majority of those are either technology or other based. That frees up the capacity for us to be able to put officers where we need to. So the, the benefits of the capital is really important, but the impact of not having the, cap the capital if you combine that with not having the revenue, you then have a really difficult situation because our systems are not going to support, let alone having reduced numbers. I hope that answers you, your question. It will make it very difficult. We are a police service. We do manage threat, harm and risk, but we would have to make choices about where our officers are going to go. I'm very grateful to your convener. Um, OK, I'll bring in Pauline McNeill, followed by Sharon Dow. Good morning. Um, Chief Constable, I mean, I'd like to sort of set the context of my lines of questioning, first of all. Um, so I recognise the, uh, the constraints of the police budget, and you've set out clearly your concerns. And it's a follow-on from Leon Kerr's questioning about the modelling you've been asked to do around a flat increase, or well, no increase, or 3%. Three, three um, first of all, a quick question, hopefully. Um, your plans for a multi-year funding arrangement, have the government given your response to that? And what has it been if they have? So, um, as I said in the in introduction, um, we've um, identified together with bor borrowing and been able to um, have um, some reserves, uh, those being three key elements to future financial planning and operational delivery that I believe is required for this for this organization the budget 1.4 billion pounds a national service a service that is going to derive and deliver benefits for the communities only if we continue to be able to make wise capital decisions and decisions about the revenue and you know technology and estate is areas of business where the decision making and the expenditure, if, it's, if we're able to do that over multi years, then actually we can keep momentum, we can manage where um, the, the, the project uh, requirements are out, around, around some of this, this investment. And these are, not, these are not areas of business that are done in, in weeks and months. These are planning and they take months and years. And this organisation, in my view, needs that more sophisticated approach in relation to the way that the, the money is, is, is provided. A question was, um, has the government given an indication or not? No, no, we've, 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 we've had some, from some early discussions. Okay. okay. Um, so on, on police numbers, so um, based on the modelling you were asked to do, which you've referred to paragraph three, um, the consequences could be that uh, police officer numbers could be as low as uh, 15,000. Uh, so does that mean then that you would have to make police officers redundant on this basis? So, so we can't, we can't on that specific question, we can't make make police officers redundant, but we can cease to recruit police right. officers, and that's the way in which we would move. Um, if, 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 that, if that was the position that we were in in terms of, of the revenue budget. Mm -hmm. So you said before that you like to think about the workforce as being 22,000. So it, it, is that more the, the, by necessity? Because I just wondered what the public think about that because and what's your view of that? Because I think... I'm clear about my constituents and the role that I play. They want to see police officers, as you say, protecting them from threat, harm and risk. So, and you also see in, I think it's paragraph 24, um, to establish a clear position on the right si size of the police force. What, what does that all amount to? So at the moment, um, there are roles within Police Scotland that are carried out by police officers that are 
um, let's use the terminology, middle, middle office roles. I would want those officers to be um, in frontline policing roles. So being very right. clear in the, in, the, in the business plan, this is about building and strengthening the front line of, right. of policing. In order, to do, in order to do that, and one of the ways that we can do that is to look at size, size shape and structure of the organisation um, and determine that there are some roles that would be better and more efficiently delivered by police staff. And we've embarked on um, a small amount of that this year. So, for example, it's in the submission um, in relation to firearms licensing officers, some civilian investigators, and also a greater proportion of um, staff within our <coughs> command and control, our, our, our communications rooms, yeah. so, so that we are able to take the experience that currently sits there so there are police officers with wealth of experience sitting in some of those roles right. and have them in front line positions and whether they're constables or Im right. really importantly sergeants and inspectors. I understand. Yeah, I mean you can see the mm. sense in that mm -hmm. um, because you want to ensure that front line policing yep. is the best it can be. Um, you're not meaning that you would civilianise police jobs. That's no, not... Uh, no, yeah. no, but I, I, I want to move... You know the, the reason I'm asking yeah, this I want is to because move... there was a... There was something in the press about you'd appointed civilians to do what looks like detective work. It's a lay person, so that's why I'm a bit yeah, concerned so, about. So, 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 to, so, so that everybody's everybody's clear. What we have done is we have um, brought in some additional police staff into key roles, and we've been able to then move effectively those police officers into frontline roles. So this is additionality, right. not instead of. Thank you. Uh, my last question um, to DCC Jean Corners. Um, OK, uh, I confess, I'm, I understand why you'd want to talk about automation. Right? I, I wanted to set the context for my lines of questioning, but you've got to look at every possibility here. It could be a very difficult budget outcome here. But automation just fills me with dread to some extent. So I'd like to know a bit more what you mean by that, because, you know, I did have concerns when we set up all these call centres way back many years ago, that the public might lose out on what they used to get. And OK, so put that to one side. Does, it, does automation mean when you phone, um, what, uh, what would it be, central police number, that you might not get to speak to a human being. I mean, that's, <laughs> you were talking there, I thought, oh, what does automation actually mean in that sense? And how will it impact on how the public get access to phoning the police when they need it? Yeah, so so I think, as you say, we're a, we're a police service and people being able to speak to somebody is, mm -hmm. is absolutely essential. We, we have all experienced the loop where you go around pressing different numbers. Exactly. So being able yeah. to talk to somebody on the end of phone is absolutely essential. However, there's a number of instances where people may phone 101 and actually they want an update on something or, or it's not actually a need to, to phone or speak to one of our advisors because they need a policing response in that sense. So being able to have a process either through public digital contact on our websites where people are able to contact police in different ways so everything doesn't come through the 101 system, that's actually what I'm talking about. And having better automation so that when if you do phone 101 you have different choices about where you go but yes you can always speak to an advisor if that is what's needed it's not a proposal that, that we just cut off the ability to speak to people that is not how policing and the public contract works thank you very much um, Sharon Dowie followed by Rona Mackay thank you good morning um, following on in the same kind of uh, line in terms of staff numbers generally you'd said in your opening statement about fluctuation through recruitment and levers can you tell us what the current predictions for police officers and police staff numbers are in the coming year so what are you recruiting towards so we will um if if as i anticipate next week we reach 16600 mm -hmm. we will throughout the rest of the financial year um, I'm going to say hover around that number um, because um, we can predict well 
the numbers of leavers. Um, but we make offers to people to join Police Scotland and on occasions they don't all turn up on the first day. So we'll hover around 16,600 16, um, over, over, over the rest of the financial year and that's what we were funded for uh, within, within this year. And then in relation to um, our police, police staff colleagues, I'm going to ask James just to, 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 to give you the detail in, in, relation, in relation to that. Yep, thank you. In, in relation to police staff, the, the assumption for the remainder of, of this financial year is that staff numbers will remain broadly constant. There will be a slight increase, which reflects the fact around what the Chief Constable was saying about bringing in specifically specific roles, people in specific roles to do jobs that are currently done by police officers to free police officers up to the front line. So that's already built into our budget for this year. But that aside, the assumption on, on officer and staff numbers is that they will remain constant. Staff numbers are, are, are easier to remain constant because it's a, it's a traditional staffing model. You, you know, people resign and you go out and you, you just go and re you re-recruit somebody. Police officers is, is slightly different in that there's the need to bring officers into the, the police college for training. So you can't do that on a daily basis. It, it happens in it happens in waves. So you know, there's an intake of probationers next week. There'll be another intake in January. But we typically see about 60 police officers either you know retire for the most part retire or, or resign a month so we can't and, and with staff like i say you get one resignation you go to recruit whereas with police officers it's a bit more lumpy in the sense that you you know you, you um can't just go and start a new course for one police officer you need to get enough numbers so in january we would expect somewhere around about 120 new probationers to come into the college that would boost the numbers so as the chief says we would expect to hover officers around 16 6 and for police staff again it would be to remain constant with the exception of the small uplift in relation to specialist roles and um, to free up police officers to go to the front line do you have figures we always hear the, the figures for full-time equivalent police officers and how many we've got and the comparison to previous years do you have anything to show how much civilian staff and the various that you could actually share with the committee, because I've never seen that. Oh, we're happy, happy to do that, convener. We can show right back to Police Scotland. Obviously, there was a big drop at the start of Police Scotland on amalgamation, but mm -hmm. since then, there's been a steadying and then there's been an increase over time. So we're, we're lower than we were at the start of Police Scotland, but we can show you that trend over the, the last 12 years. Yeah. It was just it was interesting because you'd mentioned about police uh, staff doing jobs that civilians could probably do, but I think civilians used to maybe do those jobs and as things have changed we've put police into it so it'd be interesting to see the fluctuation in civilian staff can, can, um, I, can, I, just add, yeah. can I add just one more, more one more point in relation in relation to that um the pipeline for um officers prospective officers um wanting to join police scotland is really strong is really strong um, and you know that that is not the situation that some of my colleagues um, have um, elsewhere in the United Kingdom. So I think it's important that um, as that the committee, um, you know, uh, hears that from me. Hears that from me di directly. So you know, our, our vision is clear. Our plan is clear. We're here talking about um, the, the the finances, um, but we are seen as an organisation. That people want to join and want to be part of and the opportunities you know in terms of across the whole of this this country are, are significant to people yeah and dcc corners had said earlier about demand resource and service delivery so a uh, polly mcneil had mentioned paragraph 24 and it said that you're working to establish a clear position in the right size of our police officer staff and volunteer workforce to address change in scale and complexity um, are you, will you give us something that shows us what you need to, to do, demand resource and service delivery, or is this going to show us the figures for the budget? So what I'll do is highlight in the, in the business plan the areas of focus, and then DCC Connors will pick up the, the process, if, if you like, this second wave of reform in Police Scotland that we've started this year and will run into, into next year to, to get us a position where shape, size, structure, efficiencies, ringing out the capacity of the organisation, maximising the front, front line being a key priority, um, enhancing our community policing footprint, supporting victims better, um, modernising the workforce, this move to 
moves our, our officers onto the front line and replace them in addition with um, police, police staff. We want to improve our um, command and control, our, our 999 and, and 101. We've talked about the, the estate and the harnessing around use of science, technology and innovation, both in terms of efficiency and effectiveness. Um, DCC Connors, Connors will, will describe to you how we're working through so that we can meet those commitments in the business plan. Thank you. So uh, I'll try and keep it high level, conscious, conscious of time. Yeah. So, so yeah, there's a number of change programmes that are ongoing at the moment, looking at service delivery and then the resources required in those. So the local police and service delivery review, that is predominantly the local policing section of Police Scotland. When Police Scotland was formed, it very much focused on specialist crime and the national divisions. There wasn't such a focus on the local policing elements. So within the local policing elements, we're looking at what is needed in response, what is needed in community policing, what is needed in local investigations, and what is needed in public protection. Those are, those are key areas. Investing into the community policing model means we do problem solving, we do prevention, we work with partners, we work with communities which actually should take the demand out in terms of being able to then respond, only need to respond to the really high levels of, of threat. So, so that's where we're looking at the service delivery in terms of our local policing. Local investigation and how it looks, links to the national divisions and then our public protection elements as well and how that links to the, to the divisions. So, so could I just pause, pause you there? Is, uh, what I was just really looking for is, are we, will those figures show us what you need to do everything that you want to do, or is it going to just show us the figures that you've got a budget for? So the, the plan over the, over the next 18 months is to enable what we think, and the Chief Constable, what is our workforce mix, and what do we need to be able to deliver all of those services? So it may show we're recruiting to 16,600, but we actually need... 17,000 or whatever, so it will show us the variations. A much more strategic view yeah. on what the organisation actually needs to be able to be fit for the future, create that's capacity and deliver for the people of no, Scotland. That's me. Could I just ask as well about the body-worn video programme? Um, it was obviously due to already have been rolled out. Um, it's now due to begin rolling out in spring next year, so can you guarantee that this will take place regardless of the budgetary position? and that all the relevant officers who need a device will be provided with one. So is that still on course to run out on time? So in relation to um, body-worn body video, obviously national, national programme rolling out um, across, across the country. Um, with that is some complexity, both in terms of, of, of the technology, um, the ability to... Um, uh, capture that technology and then move it around the criminal justice justice system. So we went through a um, complex process of procurement um, during the summer and we are now working um, at pace to deliver that capability, um, which is, um, is something that I think will be an absolute game changer mm -hmm. for, um, for us, uh, but, but more importantly for our communities for the criminal justice system and and our partners, um, nobody nobody wants that technology on officers' um, vests more 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 than I more than I do. Um, when I have got um, some more detail, um, I will provide that to the committee. Um, I am anticipating that spring uh, delivery, but I will bring more detail in due course. Um, you know, I, I, I need to. Um, reinforce uh, this is a complex piece of, of technical capability, digital capability. Um, you know the camera, as, as you all know, the camera is the easy bit. You know we see we see we see lots of, of people in in different uh, roles and professions using cameras. It's the connectivity that is the is the important bit because without that, we're not realising and exploiting the full potential of the system. But the full cost is in the budget for like, training all police officers on yes. procedures for it, yes. on implementing the infrastructure in yes. all the different stations yes. to put them in. Right, that's yes. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, Rona Mackay and then Fulton McGregor. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. If I could just pick up on where my colleague Shan Berry left about the body-worn cameras, and you know this has been in the, the realm for the past decade, really, 
Um, so how confident are you that that connectivity that you're talking about, which seems to be the kind of roadblock, will be uh, overcome? You know, um, you know, how far away are we? I, I know you're anticipating spring, but um, it seems to have been a long, long time in the mix. So that's that's the complexity of it is the connect on, on the connectivity. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to repeat um, what I've just just said in terms of um, nobody wants this more than I do. We are working um, as hard as we can to ensure the successful rollout of this piece of capability, which, as you rightly so say, um, is, is something um, that, that is, or is it, has been um, in place elsewhere in the United Kingdom for some for some time. But in, in terms of the of the detail of the complexity, I will come back by way of, of writing to the committee as it as it progresses. Okay, thank you for that. Um, can I just ask you a few questions about the three-year um, business plan priorities? And don't want to labour the point, but. In part of your submission, you say um, we'll seek to streamline back office functions to create efficiencies, notwithstanding what you've been saying about um, you know, getting police onto the front line and, and, and all that. Does that mean it would affect admin staff? You know, are we talking redundancies for the number of people who are working in offices without any police you know, um, training? OK. So um, those roles, um, those... Uh, uh, roles are, are really important, um, particularly uh, within our, our local policing policing areas. But as as the as the deputy has said, um, haven't been subject of um, any review in the past. In the time that, that Police Scotland's existed, um, new technologies have have come in. In um, for example, we now have one single crime system. We used to have eight or nine different crime systems. So each time we move to uh, new technology and greater connectivity, quite clearly we're looking to automate some of those, those processes and give access to the best information, give um, our officers and staff access to the best information. We don't, have, we don't have the facility to make anybody redundant, and that's not something that we, we would want to do. But it's right and proper that you know that we are looking to ensure that we are delivering policing as efficiently and effectively as we can. And it may be that there may be some administrative roles in the future that we say through advancements in technology and reorganising the way in which um, our local policing is arranged, that those individuals move into into different into different roles yeah so thank you so you're saying no redundancies but a, a change in uh, emphasis and and move into different roles possibly a, 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 a or an organization and a, and a change and that's why, why, why we talk about you know size shape and structure okay thank you um and if i could move on to the part where you talk about supporting victims mm -hmm. and um you say you're going to support victims through improved trauma-informed policing and a victim-centred approach. Um, how are you doing that and how's that going so far? Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. So thank you very much for the question. I think one of the key, the key elements of the vision is making sure that, that supported victims was, was part of it. Um, trauma-informed <laughs> training has been rolling out, so it, it comes at different levels. We have probationers who are trained in, in how to deal initially with victims. We make sure that our control room staff, people who take the call from the very beginning, have trauma-informed training. And then depending on the specialism that you might be in, it might be domestic abuse, it might be sexual offences, you will have more in-depth trauma-informed training. The, the purpose around it is also to make sure that we, we look at not just the training, but what does that victim in particular need? Because every victim is different and they will all need different things. So how do we tailor our response and our investigation in particular to that particular victim? So all of those facets are coming through. Some of it is training, some of it is custom and practice and making sure that we change our processes so that we have governance over when is a victim being updated so that we actually say to a victim, we're going to, we're going to update you at this point and they get a meaningful update. So, so, so the, interrupt. is that um, actually happening? At the it minute? is happening, yeah. yes, okay. it is. Good, thank you. And then finally, I just want to ask you about the, the science, innovation and technology part. You mentioned um, 
developing, the use of data science, etc. And you also mentioned artificial intelligence. I'm just wondering if you could maybe let us know what part that would play in the ongoing policing. Yeah, so, so artificial intelligence is, uh, I think, it, not misconstrued, but, but there's different artificial intelligence. There's automation where you, you take a, a significant volume of data and it turns it through and, and it produces insights at the end of it. You know, what, what we're not doing is, is using decision-making, using AI to make decisions that should be made by humans. But in terms of the technology, so if we look at, for example, as part of our corporate functions... There isn't currently a system that has the finance and the people and you can do self-service. So as a line manager or as an individual officer, I can't go onto an app and say, I need to be able to book my shifts or find out what my rest days are. So being able to have automation in our, some of our systems so we can take out the demand that's sitting on some of our officers and the way they do things is really important. We've talked about large volumes of data, either investigations or in other areas where either robotics or the actual AI will be able to look at that data and then be able to give insights out to it. So, so we're not talking about AI in the terms of decision-making processes. Yeah. We're talking about it being able to take out the volume of work that sits behind the NHS and other public services use it in a number of different ways. So it's our ability to be more efficient by using robotics or self-service and using those mechanisms. Thank you. That, that's helpful. I'm, I mean, I just I can't help thinking about the contrast between what you're saying, which, which sounds great, you know, future proofing and forward planning, and and the problems we're having with the connectivity for body-worn cameras. When when all that seems very futuristic, and other forces in the UK are using body-worn cameras, I'm, I still can't understand quite the complexities and the the you know the problems that you're running into. So, sorry, so, so I think, and that's why the capital in, investment is so important, because a lot of this relies on the infrastructure, but actually we have a lot of that in train at the moment, and we will then be able to turn on and use the capability and the capacity that is within our digital systems. Mm -hmm. But that capital investment is absolutely essential to be able to bring our systems up to where they need to be. So, okay. Thank you. Thanks, convener. Fulton McGregor, followed by Ben McPherson. Thanks, convener, and uh, good morning uh, to, to the panel. Uh, Chief Constable, yourself and your colleagues have spoken before about um, the general inefficiencies in the, the criminal justice system uh, as a whole, uh, and a particular bugbear for this committee um, uh, that we've raised several times in these sessions and, and in different sessions involving the police, is the issue about court appearances for police officers. Um, I think we all know that it, it can sometimes take considerable. It can take police officers away for considerable periods of time. Can I ask, from the last time that you were here speaking to the committee, have you, have you had any further um, discussions with the Crown uh, around this and, and, and how things are progressing in that area? Because I imagine it, it, it could lead to significant savings of, of time and money. Thank you. Um, and um, you. You, you quite rightly uh, um, have, have articulated the, the position that, that we've, we've found ourselves in. So just by, by way of some um, headlines to reinforce the point, but there is a, um, some, some positive and some, some light in this space. We spent £3.4 million last year on overtime for officers to attend court, and in only about 1 in 10, 10% of the time did we give evidence and of that 3.4 million pounds in overtime over 2 million was spent because officers were called to court on um, annual leave and rest days that is quite frankly a disgrace um, in terms of use of public money and equally important the intrusion on people's um, private lives and I'm sure we'd all agree that in the year 2024, what might have been acceptable 30 years ago um, is not acceptable when we consider issues of, you know, right to a private life, Article 8, um, and finding the balance between what is often very challenging police work and the time to be able to rest and recuperate with family and friends. Um, on a daily basis, four to 500 officers in courts waiting not always giving evidence, in fact, most of the time not, not, giving, not giving evidence. 
So, you know, um, a year a year into this role, um, that that was very stark um, that position for me uh, in terms of looking across the organisation and seeing where where the waste is. Um, there's an economic impact of that because for each of these cases, there's a victim, there are witnesses, they're going to court. Um, their expectations are, are being built up and, and then um, the, system, the system is failing them. But within all of that, what I can say, um, and there's been some um, significant um, uh, leadership shown by the Sheriff Principal um, at Glasgow, Sheriff Principal Anwar, um, who we work with very closely, um, in driving summary case management. So, so this is... Um, ensuring that we, the police, provide all the evidence at the beginning of, of a case, effectively, so that it gives the best prospect of finalising the case on the first or second hearing. And often we're seeing these cases going in three, four, five times. Mm. So that needs um, resourcing from our point of view and a, an expectation from me in, in relation to the way in which we prepare the evidence so it's ready to go on the first occasion but also leadership shown by the judiciary, by the Crown, by the courts, in really driving, driving the, 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 um, the efficiency and the rate at which these cases are being heard. I mean, as a side, and, and, and to give you some reassurance, um, we, are, we are presenting to the Crown and seeing more cases going through the courts than ever. So the reason I say that is to identify to you the rate of productivity and the increased productivity that uh, Police Scotland are delivering um, for, for, for the benefit of the, of the public. So we've agreed um, across the partnership uh, landscape um, that summary case management will now roll out across the country. Um, it's complemented by DESK, which is the way in which digital evidence gets, gets into the criminal justice um, um, system and that will derive some significant benefits in terms of the efficiency and the rate at which these um, these trials get heard and that's for the benefit of both the, the alleged perpetrator as well as as victims victims and witnesses so I'm really grateful for the for the leadership and and the partnership working there's more to be there's more to be done um, but there is there is some some positive steps being taken. So I'm happy to report that to the committee. Uh, it's definitely good to hear that there is some progress um, being made in that. But I think I think we could all probably agree if it, it, if it could happen even quicker. Um, there was three. You, you talked about th about three million pounds there. Is it was paid out in overtime, so that was for police officers that are on holiday or or off or, or whatever the case might be. Do you have any idea what the cost, uh, the actual cost, is for those who are on their shift that day, and they um, uh, and they then have to take the whole day at court? And is that would that be a cost you would um, you would record in hours, as 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 opposed to money? But then it, obviously, it does have an impact on the service. So the uh, analysis, um, and, and James might be um, doing doing some sums in his head at the moment. So. So, you know, four or five hundred officers a day um, in, in, in court, and if only 10% of them give evidence, then, um, you know, 90% is, is wasted capacity that we're not able... So, so those officers aren't, aren't, aren't in, their, in their roles, doing their, their, their core, core roles. Um, and there's only a one... For, for our response officers, for example, there's only a one in five chance that the court... Um, date will will um, align with arrest day because they're either early late nights um, and then and then there's two shifts that are off at any one time so because currently and this this again is, is a move in the right direction no cognizance has been taken when the court uh, when the trial dates are set often it's falling on these rest days and annual leave days and it has an impact on the front on the front line of, of, of policing um, I don't know whether in turn we might have to come back on that on that specific point. I mean, I, I, just to give you an idea, I mean, 500 officers cost the, the taxpayer £25 million pounds a year, approximately. So if 90% if of that is, is not effective, that's £22.5 million pounds worth of lost productivity. Okay. Uh, just add as well, if, if officers are on for court and therefore the response level strengths drop, 
then we have to backfill. We have to cancel somebody else's rest day so they can work on the team so that person to goes, goes to court. So it's, it's a constant chain of, of movement and cancel rest days as well. So it's just to add that context. OK, that, that's really useful. Right. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Just on that figure of £22.5 million, is that per annum yeah. at, at the moment as it stands? Thank yes. you. Okay. Sorry. Could also ask me just um, just just one further question, convener, if that's okay. Um, another area of uh, inefficiency that has been discussed before is perhaps how the whole system works together. And we've talked before uh, in here about police officers dealing with mental health situations um, when maybe traditionally would maybe think they're more for health professionals, uh, health and social care professionals. Have you had any? Has there been any discussion since you've come into role with? Um, the NHS and you know Social Work Scotland and other bodies about how maybe more efficiencies can be can be made in that area. Yeah, yes, I'll, I'll ask DCC Connors um, to 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 provide you some of the of the detail in terms of the progress that that we've made in that space and those and those conversations uh, and discussions are, are taking to place, but some very practical steps um, have been taken. Yeah, absolutely. So. So there's pockets of really, really good practice ac across the whole of Scotland, and, and we've seen a number of, of different areas. But key things that have started to embed uh, and going forward is the mental health pathway that's in C3, which is our com command and control divisions, um, and that's in collaboration with NHS 24. And that is about making sure that we can get referrals at the first point of contact before we even have to dispatch officers out, because actually officers turning up in uniform obviously are very often not the right first point of call. So working with NHS 24, there's 3,808 um, referrals that have been made since September 2023, and about 360 referrals per month. So, so we're starting to see the momentum on that. And what that means is we're starting now to take the demand out of the system in terms of offices, which sounds very clinical, but actually what we're doing is making sure that the person that calls us gets the right help at the right time from the very first point of call. There is also the mental health index, which is where actually every officer on their local area can now access 24-7 into the right clinician in their particular area. So they, they're able 24-7 to look at the mental health index come through to a clinician who will say, actually, this is, this is where this person needs to go or this is the care that's required. So, so those are two practical things where we're starting to see the change in the, the dealing with mental health very much on a partnership basis rather than, than just police. And it's starting to make sure that the individual gets the right care, but also means that police officers are not then sitting or dealing with that person all the way through to A&E &E and, and the other factors. Yeah, which we, which we do see quite often. Uh, as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. Convener. Thank you. Um, so, Ben McPherson, um, and then I think some members want to come back in with some follow-up questions, and then I'll bring in Liam Kerr, so Ben. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, I just want to take matters back to capital, just for a, a, a moment, and I have one question on revenue as well. With regard to capital, the statements in paragraph 12 about securing multi-year funding commitments and uh, from the Scottish Government and the exercise of statutory borrowing powers uh, and a facility to enable the carry forward of financial reserves. I'd just be interested if you could say a bit more about how that dialogue has been with the Scottish Government with a, a sense of the challenges that the Scottish Government faces with its constricted ability to borrow and have multi-year funding because of the nature of the fiscal framework and the fact that in uh, most aspects of the, the Scottish Government's budget, it is only uh, having clarity provided on an annual basis because of the way the, the UK Government uh, budgeting has worked. And, and you know, what, what, what would be a welcome update from the Chancellor today in all of this wider consideration about how we plan the capital investment that is clearly essential for the delivery of the service. So the the discussions the discussions to date um, and, and um, are are very very similar to to the case we make in in the in the submission you've seen in terms of articulating both the um, 
the, the reason why from a financial best value, good use of, 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 of public money, it makes sense, but it also allows us to plan from an operational point of view so that we are able to support our officers um, so that they can deliver the best for, for the communities of, of, of Scotland. And, um, and part of those discussions have been, you know, a recognition, and, and, and I said it earlier, earlier um, uh, today, a recognition of the, of the size and scale of this organisation um, and that running on an annualised basis um, means that we turn the taps on and off, whether that's in relation to our people, the recruitment of them, or whether that's in relation to um, investment in, in, in capital um capital areas uh, areas of capital um and and that um is is contrary to to making those longer term plans and financial decisions and the agreement in year for for this funding for this current year um was a, a commitment from scottish government that they could see and they supported a direction of travel and the um, very clear um, presentation of this is our three-year business plan. This is what um, the second phase of police reform looks like for, for, for Police Scotland. And that it's clear what we're going to deliver for, for the public. But key to that is the way in which the money's, the money's arranged. Mm -hmm. And I want us to make good decisions, make good investment and ensure that the the kit and the buildings are the best for the public and, and the people working working from them. I, I absolutely understand the principle and the mm. ambition. I was more interested in the, the dialogue and on the on the technicalities and the challenges within the, well, the legislative environment. Um, well, it's, 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 yes, well, sim similar to, you know, um, some of it's dependent on decisions and announcements in Westminster mm. Westminster today, um, and some of it is is dependent on whether we can, and and um, we'll go with the technical terms in terms of the way we're seen as an organisation mm. within within Scotland, um, and a move to the way in which the local authorities are able to work, where they're able to hold reserves and make those um, multi multi year decisions. Yeah, thank you. Just picking up on the, the Chief Constable's points, they, we're in the early stage of discussions with the Scottish Government officials. The, the Accountable Officer and I are looking to, to speak to some senior officials over the, the coming weeks in relation to this. There have been conversations in, in years gone by, and the, the conversations have been limited by the, 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 kind of the, the statutory and the, the fiscal framework on, under which the Scottish Government operates. I suppose our ask is, is more around the, the, the principles, around the fact that you know, we, we are the only police service in Great Britain that cannot borrow and, cannot, and does not have reserves, which was created um, as a consequence of, of Police Scotland co coming into being. Obviously, prior to Police Scotland, the old legacy forces could borrow, they could carry forward reserves because they were under that local government framework. Whereas now Police Scotland is, is under the is under a national framework, and we had a similar conversation a number of years ago about VAT, and that P Police Scotland couldn't recover VAT upon you know being in civil national service. It's the same principles around borrowing and, and, and use of reserves, and it does make it difficult um, to be able to, to plan ahead. And particularly as the chief had said earlier on, in relation to um, buildings, for example, or, or digital programmes where you know they might take two, three, four years to be delivered. So. That's the principle of, of the conversation that we're looking to have. The final point on the multi-year, completely understand that around the, the challenges around, you know, if, if there's only single-year settlements coming from Westminster and the challenges that presents the Scottish Government. I suppose it's, it's, a, it's a general point, it's, it goes beyond Police Scotland, but, you know, if, if meaningful public sector reform, there does need to be an element, an element of certainty around what investment will be made available over a period of time, because, you know, we're talking here an, an initial three-year business plan followed by another three years to get to 2030. And without having an, an understanding about whether there will be funding forthcoming, it's about how much, how much time and energy do you put into looking at redesigning your estate or changing the way in which you deliver a particular service if, if actually the, the, the investment won't be there in order to, to implement it. And it does become very difficult and you end up in that annual cycle, as the Chief was saying. And of course, the lesson from I6 was to do things in a staged and processed way rather than 
um, big bang, so to speak. Um, just on the states, so I just wondered if there's some thinking that's going on in terms of the communications from Police Scotland with communities. Uh, I think what the, the Chief Constable said earlier on about this is this will be an enhancement of the estate, moving the estate into the 21st century while maintaining local presence and capability. I do, I, I do think there, I can, I can speak from my constituent perspective that, there, the, and I know, I know it's elsewhere, that the, the, the concern locally will be that things are closing rather than that things are changing and being enhanced. And I do think some consideration about the communications may be useful in that regard. Um, just one last question on revenue, please, Convener. Uh, DCC uh, Connors, you, you talked about the importance of community policing and the difference that that can make in terms of creating uh, preventative uh, action and also um, the the preventative uh, ability it has to create flexibility. Um, I don't know if you wanted to say a bit more about what what would be helpful in the in the period ahead financially to to undertake that preventative spend to a greater extent. Um, what resources you know would make a meaningful difference in the Christie principles and and all of that area of the consideration that the Parliament is is in this. Uh, is thinking about with regard to public sector reform. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, on a couple of levels, one is the ability of us to create capacity. So that links back to the capital asks, which is our ability to be more efficient through our technical solutions, being able to be more efficient where we put our estates, where we can deploy, deploy people from. So that is a key thing, is being able to re relieve that capacity. Because if we create the capacity with officers, we can then put them into doing the things that they need to be doing. Um, in terms of being able to then move the organisation round, being able to relieve out of the, we'll call it back of house, and I do, I understand that that really upsets some of our police staff colleagues. It's not about being back of house, it's being put everything onto the front line. That again is about being able to have those resources that over customer practice have just grown into, into the middle area and be able to put those out. That links back to the workforce modernisation and the strategic workforce planning that we need to do is what roles does the organisation have, what needs a warranted officer to be able to do those roles and how can we put warranted officers back and strengthen the front line. So there is the strategic workforce planning area that comes in as well. All of that requires us to be able to look forward either for the technical efficiency and capacity creation the working with partners to make sure that we can again build capacity around problem solving and prevention and then the final piece is that workforce mix so so all of that requires the multi-year funding but also the investment in all the revenue the capital and also the reform because the reform funding is what we use to do our transformation programs and we have the specialists in those areas so we need all of those three which is why the bid that we've put forward has been really clear around what we need and why. And all of those will deliver the changing shape of the organisation, fraud, cyber, being able to move forwards with some of the crime trends that we know are coming and invest in our community model as well. And the final thing is to say that, that police staff play an essential part in Police Scotland. And the restructuring and the looking at the enablers and the corporate functions, we've already talked about being able to develop people. It's not just about officers. Police staff are, are absolutely essential to the organisation as well. Thank you. Thanks, Camille. We just come in on um, one of Ben's questions, um, going back to the um, discussion around borrowing powers. Um, James, you um, answered very helpfully um, and gave a bit more detail on the discussions that are ongoing with officials. And I think earlier in, in, in um, the evidence provided, you spoke about um, uh, how I think 200 million was a, a figure that I think was quoted as, as, as being um, one that you'd be looking to borrow. Uh, has there been any discussion around the sort of practicalities of, of that? So um, how would it work? Who would you be borrowing from? Who would perhaps cover at risk if there's a default um, and um, interest payments that, you know, more the practicalities. Have you reached that point yet? Thank you, Convener. The, we, internally within the service, we have used um, the, the kind of the potential framework that local government uses, the potential code. We've looked at PWL 
be the public mm -hmm. um, works Works loans board mm -hmm. rates and how we might structure borrowing against the construction of new assets in, in the estate, for example, and, and the cost of the, the repayment of that debt to see whether it would be affordable against the savings and the, through the efficiencies that we think we would generate by having a more modern estate to give us an initial you know, view that, that, that we're confident that that would be affordable. The actual conversations, though, were the, the intention is that the accountable officer of the, the police authority and I would go and speak to probably the, the, the director general, um, Alison Stafford, and, 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 and the chief financial officer and um, the, the accountable officer and I have, have written formally to seek um, a meeting to have the technical discussions around what that might look mm -hmm. like. Okay, th thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Okay, we are actually up to time, but I know some members would like to come in with some supplementary questions. Um, if the Chief Constable and um, our other witnesses have a little bit of flexibility, maybe another 10 minutes or so, um, would be very helpful. So on that, I'm going to bring in Liam Kerr and then Sharon Dowie. I'm very grateful, Convener. I'll be brief. Uh, I was very interested, Chief Constable, in a particular part of your submission around where you stated that the financial implications of current legislation are significantly higher than you're able to absorb in your business as usual activity. Now, this is something that, in particular, the Finance Committee, but many parliamentarians have been increasingly concerned about. Uh, so I have a particular interest in that section. Can you tell me, first of all, what's the cost uh, that was... Is the cost you're facing of that legislation broadly what was predicted by the financial memorandum to these uh, bills at the time? And in any event, since you've built the cost of meeting those demands into your budget ask, what if the Scottish Government doesn't cover it? So within the submission, we have um, detailed two significant pieces of legislation, I think both, certainly the PEX bill um, and possibly the domestic uh, abuse um, proposals have um, had some airtime at this, at this committee. It's an area of business that we have put uh, additional rigour in relation to our assessment of the impact. So it is, it is right, reasonable and proper that for some pieces of legislation, um, you would expect um, 22,000 people, £1.4 billion, to absorb that. So um, I'll, use, I'll use the example of um, XL bully dogs and a um, piece of legislation, very important, to keep the public safe, um, had to be um, implemented at, at pace. And I, I use that as an example of something we absorbed um, within, within, um, within the resources that we have. But... Um, at the same time, um, more detailed exploration on our part in terms of the implications around implementation of those legislations, I think is important both for this committee, for decisions in relation um, to the settlement um, for, for next year, and, and highlighting that um, while um, there are some significant positives across those proposed pieces of legislation, they don't, they don't come for free. In relation to the response or your question about, so what's the impact if we don't? Well, I'll take you back to, to, to DCC um, Connor's response. It's the, the management of the, of the threat and the risk and where, where we, where we, where we prioritise uh, where we prioritise our efforts. I'm very grateful. Just let me press you on one point. Mm. Just, uh, do you think, and I appreciate you may not be in a position to answer this, I might put this to the SPA later, uh, did Parliament accurately predict in its financial memoranda to this legislation the cost to policing? Because, of course, if not, there's something going wrong at this end. It, which, which piece of legislation specifically? So you've raised, for example, a domestic abuse protection legislation as incurring a cost. Uh, you've talked about the age of criminal responsibility. So within the financial memorandum, there will have been... A, a prediction Understood. of what that will cost Understood. you as policing. Did Parliament get that right? So, so what what isn't just ensure that that I'm accurate here? What we have um, analysed is is also the opportunity mm. cost. I don't think that features in the in the memorandum. Is that right? Is that right? 
Yeah, so um, it's it's fair to say, I mean, th this isn't something I would want to say where, where the, the apportionment of responsibility would lie, for example, around the, the true cost of legislation, but there certainly has been, I think, historically a weakness in the system around being able to understand the operational implications of, of all legislation and then accurately cost it. That's something that there's been a lot of focus on over the past 18 months or so in order to be really on top of that and that's why we're bringing better data coming through which as the chief said captures the additional cost which is what is included within the, the budget submission here so things like external legal fees which is just something we can't avoid versus the time that would be used internally on you know for training and and and, and so on so i mean that's something we would need to take away and have a look a bit bit more detail about what's happened in the past but certainly it's something that's been a, a focus um, of, of improvement over the past 18 months, and that's why there's far better data coming through. Yeah, it's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Sharon Dowie and then Rona Mackay. Sharon. Thank you. Just a quick thing, going back on to inefficiencies. Um, Mr Grade mentioned earlier on about the estate being too big and inefficient. We also mentioned a station that had custody suites that weren't used. So I'm actually just wondering if there's anything that's been cut in the past due to budget constraints and we're trying to make um, efficiencies that's then proved not to be cost effective and maybe needs to be reversed, but you don't have the budget for it. And I'm actually thinking about custody suites because I've spoken to officers who've said that they used to be able to go in and process a prisoner and be back out operational within an hour, but now they can spend a full shift having to drive round to try and find a custody suite in whatever locality it'll end up being. So I'm just wondering, is that an efficient use of police time? And, and would you want to reverse that and open up more custody suites? And this is a, a piece of work that's ongoing at the moment and has been picked up through the, the work on the three-year business plan and, and what the future model for, for custody looks like. I, I've, I've also... I've seen it. I've been out on shift and seen some of the the, the, the kind of bottlenecks at, at, at trying to, to 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 book in at custody suites. That's something that is being looked at from an operational perspective, and then the estate requirements will will come in off the back of that. But what what we are clear about is that there absolutely needs to be the right model. This isn't about the, what we're trying to do with the estate is to provide the right provision to support the future delivery of the service and not about cost reduction which is why you know we there will be investment required here but um as part of that as i say the overall operator model is is being reviewed and about whether we've got the right numbers in the right locations and, wh and whether they're staffed to the appropriate levels as well because that is quite often what causes delays in in, in um at custody that's currently under review because obviously that will have a knock on effect for geo amy as well who are obviously yeah. under operational Issues as yep. well. Right, thank you. Okay, thank you. And Rona Mackay. Thanks. Thanks. Vina, just a very brief question to, to James Gray. It goes back to an element of Ben McPherson's questioning. Um, and throughout our constituencies, a lot of older, not fit for purpose police um, offices have been closed. Do you have figures for the capital take on that so far? I'd need to, to, to write to committee about what the, the capital receipts for the buildings already closed mm -hmm. um, since the creation of Police Scotland. It's, it's over 100 buildings, but I, I would be able to write out with what the the, 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 the capital receipts of yeah. that have, have been. I suppose the, what the point around the future is it's, it's not about closing buildings and just propping up and, and patching up what we've got, what we're proposing through the estate's master plan, which will, more will be discussed at the SPA board in November is about a new model so it's not well, and, and, I understand yeah. that but it's still putting money into your capital okay. it is yeah. Yeah. yeah okay but that would be helpful if you could okay. tell us that that would be great thank you okay thank you very much I wonder if I can maybe just come in with a very final question it was something that um has received a, a wee bit of media coverage recently and that is um, live facial recognition technology so just interested in um, if you have any update at all on any work that's being proposed um, to be taken forward, is it something that would require a budget allocation? Is that already perhaps factored into some of your sort of innovation and technology budgeting? Um, it's just if there's any update that you could share on that, it would be interesting. Thank you. Um, so in relation to that specific capability, um, I know that there's a, a lot of interest in, in relation to it and um, some strong, strong feelings mm -hmm. in, in, some, in some quarters. 
Um, my role is to ensure that I balance um, you know, human rights and, and privacy with um, using technology to, um, you know, to be effective in keeping people safe and finding, and finding the balance yeah. between, between those. Earlier in the year, myself, um, uh, Mr Evans, Chair of S SPA, um, and the Biometrics Commissioner, um, we held a conference in, um, in relation to, to biometrics, and obviously facial recognition is, is, part, is part of that. And one of the things that came out of that event was um, a need by us collectively to um, start a conversation, a dialogue in relation to, to this piece of technology. It has been used elsewhere in the United Kingdom. We have followed um, very closely lessons learned, uh, how the technology has been used, how the AI um, mm -hmm. is, is deployed uh, as, the, as the important issue in, in all of this. So we will continue that conversation um, and we will work towards at, a, at, a, um, at a, an appropriate pace um, decision, dialogue as to the direction of travel for Police Scotland, mm -hmm. um, but recognising the sensitivities in that space. Yeah, and presumably any sort of budget requirement out of that would be sort of factored into your conversations. Yeah, for the yeah. For, for the future, we haven't factored anything specifically in into the capital budget so so far. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. So um, we're going to bring this session to a close. Thank you very much, and to all our panel members. Uh, and with that, we'll have a short suspension just to allow for a changeover. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, uh, members. So, our next panel of witnesses this morning uh, are representatives of the Scottish Police Authority, and we're joined by Martin Evans, Chair, uh, Ms Lynn Brown, Chief Executive, uh, and Ms Fiona Douglas, Director of Forensic Services with the SPA. So, welcome to you all. I um, intend to allow around about 60 minutes uh, for the session. Um, so I wonder if I can just begin by coming to yourself, uh, Martin Evans, uh, to begin with, uh, with an opening question, just to set the scene, um, and then we'll move on to members' questions. So you've obviously been um, listening to the um, evidence provided by uh, Police Scotland this morning, but I'm interested in, from the SBA's perspective, what do you consider are the main financial challenges facing Police Scotland uh, and your own organisation? And what is the position of the SPA in terms of its advice to the Scottish Government on what budget resource is needed for policing, um, given the scenarios that the Scottish Government has asked uh, Police Scotland to model? Thank you, Convener. The, the Authority has two key objectives for policing in this context. The firstly is to ensure a sustainable police budget service mm -hmm. in Scotland. And secondly, to maintain a, a balanced annual budget. Now, clearly, those are intentioned, as your questioning to the Chief Constable has, uh, has, has, has um, set out. Our written submission is that next financial year, policing requires a 4.2% increase in its annual rev revenue budget to address pay awards and inflationary pressures. And looking beyond 25-26, we set out a need for a very significant increase of around £200 million over the next decade in capital spending to address investment shortfalls in our estate and technology. I think that over this time, over this period that I have been chair, we have seen an increase in revenue to Police Scotland of about £255 million. And we have achieved 96% of our call for increased funding over the time I've become chair. I think I'd emphasise, as your committee has been questioning, this issue of capital investment. And we are making the case to the Scottish Government, if it can't be made by grant funding, the traditional way, the authority would request other sources and flexibilities in financing mm -hmm. uh, uh, to address the issues of annuality, which is a very great stop yeah. on planning. Unlocking our ability to borrow capital. We have a, a power to borrow capital under Section 4 of our, the Act setting us up and to innovate in the receipt of capital, in, in, in terms of how we can use capital receipts, and indeed, as James Gray said, hold reserves. Mm -hmm. So that is our strategic position, and uh, we are with Police Scotland in terms of making a, a combined uh, ask for both capital and revenue mm -hmm. uh, in our submission to the Scottish Government when it goes uh, later on, uh, well, next month it will be. Okay, th th thank you for that. Um, one of the areas of discussion earlier, as, as you know, was also multi-year um, settlements and, and the, the benefit of that. And certainly in your own submission, uh, you advocate for a multi-year settlement approach. Um, I just wonder if you could maybe sort of outline to the committee a, a, a bit around the impact um, of not having multi-year budgets, um, and you obviously spoke about uh, annual budgets and the sort of challenges that they uh, present. And why? What are the main factors that make multi-year funding more advantageous? I will say something. Can I pass over to our accountable okay. officer? Multi-year uh, has this this impact. Every year, policing has to meet the budget on the dot. It it, it can't overspend. Otherwise, we get uh, Section 22s from the Audit Scotland. And if it underspends, we get, of course, a lot of uh, criticism that we haven't spent the police budget. So bringing in annually on, t on target is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. It also means that the fluctuation that Chief Constable talked about our police officer numbers have to be dealt with annually. You can't slightly over and slightly under. You have to hit the target. And that means conservative approach to officer numbers. Uh, that, that's the second thing. The other thing, before I pass on, is about capital receipts. If you see in our, our profiling of capital receipts, as we see it over the next four or five years, in year three, the capital receipts are quite high, significantly higher than it might otherwise be. Annuality means you can't anticipate that. You have to hand it back if it's not being spent in that year. 
and th those are the critical aspects of annu annuality. It, it drives a more conservative approach to revenue and police officer numbers, and it actually doesn't allow you to do proper financial planning to mm -hmm. actually invest in our crumbling estate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Lynn, do you want to come yes. in? Yeah. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Convener. Um, Multi-year um, budgets would actually help with the duty of best value, yeah. where you can plan. Um, and, uh, for example, uh, there was questions earlier on about the pay award. If you've, if you've got multi-year um, uh, budgets, you can deal in a much more strategic way with uh, trade unions and staff associations around pay. Um, you can um, also plan in, in a sensible way for expenditure. And I'd also say that I think that you have to have that need for reserves has to be linked to that three-year planning. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, a, there's someone described to me landing the budget. It's like landing an airplane on a pin for Police Scotland. You know, it's a huge uh, budget, and yet you have to get it to the wire on the 31st of March. So um, for me, it's planning. It's in good support, best value. It would help with uh, workforce relationships mm -hmm. in terms of pay awards. Um, and it would also help the Chief Constable for the first time has done her three-year business plan, which mm -hmm. she talked about earlier. That would absolutely help that be delivered. Yeah. Um, so in terms of strategic planning, no business would do it on a year-by-year -year basis. Um, and I understand the constraints around that. But if in any way that could be moved, it would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. OK, th thank you for that. And, and, in, and indeed, I think in my opening question... Um, we looked at the, the obviously the, the, the benefit of uh, multi-year and the three-year uh, plan in the context of sort of spend to save, if you like. So that investment in capital um, allocation uh, and the, the, the sort of long-term efficiencies uh, that that can bring across a, a range of different aspects of Police Scotland. I, I take it then you, you would be very supportive of, of, of that. Uh, absolutely supportive of that. Mm -hmm. I think uh, if we could get uh, multi-year financial planning in both revenue and capital, mm -hmm. it would allow the workforce planning and the delivery planning to be far more effectively mm -hmm. done. It also mean we wouldn't stop and start on a whole range of issues where we have to either overcommit in a financial year to a capital or spend it quickly at the end because if we didn't spend, we'd lose it. I think those are the, the, the wicked issues of annuality yeah. and their drain on the public purse. It means that we're not as effective in delivering a, a good value, best value, as yeah. the Chief Executive said. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. So with that, I'll open questions up to members and I'll bring in Liam Kerr and then Rona Mackay. Very grateful, Kavina. Good morning, panel. Uh, on a similar note, uh, you heard me ask earlier about these two scenarios that have been modelled. Uh, the flat cash settlement... Uh, which could result in 1,300 fewer officers, uh, and Police Scotland submission, which talks about if the 3% reduction happens, it could go below 15,000. How inevitable, Martin Evans, is uh, that outcome? If, so, for example, if I see flat cash in the budget, am I then seeing 1,300 fewer officers by March 2026? Well, the context is 85% of the revenue costs of Police Scotland are people. So a flat cash can only really impact on the number of people. And flat cash has two major, no, no pay increase, and you also have to then uh, pay the budget without pay increase to the, the 80, 87%. So in answer to your question, the inevitability is flat cash means a reduction in the human resource available to Police Scotland. It is not inevitable. It only comes from police officer numbers. It can come from a mix of police officer and staff numbers. But I think the, the issue here is there's greater degree of flexibility in police officer numbers, uh, surprisingly, because they leave and go in higher numbers because they are uh, uh, three quarters of that 85, 87% are police officers. So there's greater flexibility to manage it within year. It, whether it's the right thing to do or not, is a completely different point. The last time policing faced these kind of pressures within austerity, it actually got rid of police staff at a very high rate and moved police officers into police staff roles. And we're unwinding that now across the United Kingdom. But I'll just again turn to Lynn Brown to say the inevitability, it will result in fewer police staff and officers. 
that mix is a matter of judgment for the police to achieve comfort to speak to us, but her flexibility is constrained by how you actually reduce those numbers. For, and I just give you this. There's no compulsory redundancy. That's a, that's a, a, a Scottish Government policy. So it has to be voluntary redundancy for police staff, and it has to be turnover and attrition for police officers. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, <coughs> as Mr Evans has said, the majority of the police budget is on staff, um, and there is limited capacity to go elsewhere for uh, efficiencies um, in terms of uh, meeting any budget. So that's why, that's why, as explained in those terms, workforce numbers. Um, um, in terms of the impact, it's already been touched on by DCC Connors earlier on, but you're just looking at pure arithmetic and looking at just sums that reflects in workforce terms um, a reduction um, if it was flat cash and beyond. Uh, Lynn Brown, I'll stay with you if you don't mind. The, specifically, you mentioned the Chief Constable's three-year plan mm -hmm. a second ago. Mm -hmm. uh, flat cash or 3% reduction, what's the impact on that three-year plan? The three-year plan at present has been um, estimated on, uh, in terms of what we call a financial envelope, which is a pay award being met, uh, unavoidable um, inflation, and that's based on the Scottish Government's recommendation, I think, of about 2%, 2% and obviously where there are contracts, and also on the cost of new legislation. So the three-year business plan is based on those assumptions. If we don't get our ask, we'd have to go back and look at the impact on that three-year business plan. I understand. Uh, Martin Evans, final question from me then. Uh, you mentioned in your opening remarks, uh, or your remarks to the convener, that your aim was sustainable policing. Uh, with such reductions in numbers, with, such, with a flat cash, with a 3% uh, budget reduction, whether to staff or officers, uh, what impact does that have on policing sustainability? And what is the impact going forward generally? Well, I'm an optimist, so I expect uh, our ask to be met. But we have to plan the scenarios, as you're pointing out, about flat cash and a reduction of 3%. We set out on page 10 the implications if it was flat cash or less, and it's going to be quite a significant implication across four broad areas, we're saying. Caring for vulnerable people, protecting children, proactive capability, which you pressed hard on, because that's a lot of effect in there, and enabling our estate. So we will see less in all of those if we had flat cash or 3%. And the reason for, for talking about police officer and staff numbers is that the remaining 13% of our budget is likely to have inflationary pressures on it. They are about the uh, fuel going into the cars. It's about the lighting and heating. None of those will stay flat cash. All those will eat in. So given the nature of this uh, service, 85, 87% human delivering the service, a flat cash, can only mean a reduction in those people, and a reduction in those people means an, an effect, a negative effect on keeping Scotland safe. Now, it's up to the Chief Constable and myself to agree how we organise that, should we face that scenario. We have the outline in our budget ask, and if we are, we have to face that. But the outline, sorry, the, the indicators of these four areas where we're going to see hard choices made, and that's been made clear over the years I've been chair, without meeting the budget ask, hard choices are going to have to be made. And they are prioritised, as the Deputy Chief Constable said, in terms of threat and harm against the people of Scotland. I'm very grateful to you all, convener. OK, thank you very much. Um, Rona Mackay, followed by Ben McPherson. Thank you, convener. Good uh, morning. Um, I'd like to go back to sort of opening questions regarding multi-year funding, and I know you'll appreciate the difficulties the Scottish Government has with that because of, of our, um, our situation. Um, you, you talked about um, having to hand back um, capital money if it wasn't spent by the 31st of March. So can I ask if, if that's a regular occurrence, and also do you have figures for that? What, what sort of money are you talking about? Um, we we plan um, we plan very strongly on spending our capital, mm -hmm. um, and we have not, as, from my experience since being a county officer, had to hand back capital. But what you do is you have what are called um, capital projects you can move on very quickly. For example, electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. So, but you may not. But but there may be other things of um, 
more important you can't do in that time frame and it's pushed into the following year so when i talk about handing back what i mean is we have to plan really to the penny to spend within that year um and it would be such more um best value if you could plan that better i understand that but mm -hmm. so basically what you're saying is you haven't had to hand any back uh, my understanding is we have not but I, i'll uh, confirm that to the committee all right thank you and then the, my other question was um, and by the way when you hand it back it goes back to the scottish okay. government yes. i take it yeah. yes um and the other question was about reserves and um, so are you looking to increase your reserves and do you have a figure you could yeah. give us for that yeah. We don't have any reserves. When, when Police Scotland moved from um, the what's termed the local government fiscal framework, which I'm very familiar with because my whole career was in that, um, we moved to central government fiscal framework, um, which you're not permitted to hold reserves. Okay. Um, so we don't have reserves. Okay. Um, and the way it would work is that if you did have that ability, you would plan for what they were, um, as all uh, local authorities do. Mm -hmm. They plan for the reserves and it's approved um, by councillors in terms mm. of so the SPA would approve what they thought the level of reserves should be yeah. and you'd have to have a business case behind that but at present we don't have any because we cannot. And, and the fact that um, Chief Constable was talking about making use of the borrowing powers, yeah. uh, will that make a difference to, to yeah. you? Yes, the borrowing powers, so the reserves very much are revenue based I would say, so that can just, as you know, smooth things out for you. On the capital, that's the borrowing powers. And again, it goes back to the fact that before, and Mr Gray uh, touched on this, that we were in a local government fiscal framework where um, my memory when I dealt with it was for every one pound of revenue um, that you had to find, you could borrow 10 million. Mm -hmm. that, that, I'm going back and going uh -huh. back a while, but I don't know what the figures would be now. It would be worth working that out. Um, so... So, so that's how you plan. So capital is the borrowing powers. The reserves are very much for revenue to, to help yeah. you over um, the, 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 the year. OK, Can thank I you. Make a short point here. Sure. Um, comparing uh, police services in England and Wales, uh, they have 1.4 times higher capital allocations than Police Scotland have. That's a very significant difference in the allocation. We're not even asked to come up to the 1.4 times to meet the average down south. Our ask will bring us to about 1.3 or so times the, uh, uh, um, what, what, what is going on down south. And that means that they both have the ability to borrow great reserves and they have a higher investment. In, in their estate, and it's the estate I'm most interested in here. The estate is what this committee has been talking about in terms of its negative impact on officer wellbeing, mm -hmm. its negative impact in terms of public perception of policing. And the final thing to say about borrowing, the estimates that James Gray have made with, the, uh, with Lynn Brown are that within the savings framework that could be uh, achieved, the borrowing from the Public Works Loan Board at those kind of rates could be repaid within the current, within the budget. Uh, so that, that's not to say it's, it can, the fiscal rules would allow it, and it's not to say that uh, it can, it, it will happen, but if it did happen, it, it, it could be contained. It's not, a, it, it could be contained uh, mm -hmm. within the policing budget f mm -hmm. from uh, savings. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, ben McPherson, then Sharon Dowie. Thank you. I, I just want to build on some of those points that have been raised by my colleague. Um, you spoke about the challenges of annuality and that you'd look to move to a local authority fiscal framework, so to speak, and I have a lot of empathy with that. Is the challenge within utilising this section of the 2012 Act, Section 42B, that the Scottish Government has less capital borrowing powers than local authorities? And the Scottish Government cannot hold reserves, unlike local authorities. Is this challenge part of the bigger issue, something we discussed in Parliament yesterday, that the Scottish Government does not have enough flexibility and capability to engage in capital borrowing? Um, thank you. That, that is why um, I have written with James to Alison Stafford and uh, Jackie McAllister to explore that, I mean, my view is very much that's their world. Um, my, my job is to ask the question, is this possible? Um, and what can be done? And it goes back to when we were planning COP26, I remember I was 
um, I, I could not, there was a certain finance issue. I, I just couldn't understand very well why we had to do a certain thing. And after a discussion with Scottish government colleagues, they made it clear this is, this is why you know, we do it in a certain way. I can't remember the actual... It was a minor thing, but it was important. So I do not understand the central government framework in detail. But my job was to say, can we discuss this? Is there any flexibility? There may not be, um, but we would like to have that discussion. I, say, I think there is a strategic issue here which you are aligned on, is about what are the UK fiscal rules, and they may be under discussion uh, today with the Chancellor, and secondly, what are the devolved rules, whether the constraints within a Scottish Parliament who can't uh, create a deficit or borrow more than an amount. But from my point of view, those are being addressed strategically through the conversations and correspondence that the Chief uh, Executive is having, but also I as a Chair have to be really clear that the capital ask is based on really strong evidence about the state of our estate and the, and the desire and the police, uh, a professional police officer view about how we're going to use that, and we haven't got to there yet. We will get to there, I believe. I've seen all the workings in our November board. But until then, we haven't had a clear understanding, surprising enough, about what the range of our state is, what square footage it is, how its use value has been, where our custody suites are being used or underused. I am now confident we are almost there, and the board will make their decision in November. We're almost there to support evidentially this huge capital investment and show the benefits of uh, three things I've asked. The benefits to public confidence, the benefits to staff welfare, and the ability to access custody suites. I think we're just about there. And that's the basis of this capital ask. The fiscal framework is far beyond our pay grade, but it is something we would seek support from uh, this committee. I appreciate that. And uh, there's the wider context of the reduction in the Scottish Government's capital budget, which um, you know, I think we would all hope the Chancellor will uh, somewhat address today at least. But I, I, I would be interested, and I'm sure colleagues would as well, that when you're in, once you've had further dialogue with Scottish Government officials, if, as appropriate, you could update this committee on the progress of discussions around Section 42B of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012, and if there are any prohibiting reasons why that is difficult to utilise as a subsection of that Act and implement, I think we should we should know about that. So yep, that we will certainly be do helpful. That. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Sharon Dowie and then Pauline McNeill. Thank you. Good morning. Um, just a quick one first as well on the body-worn videos. Are you aware of the current situation with the rollout and are you happy that enough has been done to roll it out at pace? Um, I don't say I'd ever be happy with the progress on rollouts. Let me Continue. put it this way. When I became chair, I said one of my four priorities was technology. Police got way behind the curve on technology. And then we were faced with COP26, uh, where we didn't have uh, body-worn video even for our armed police officers. And that was an extraordinary uh, way to go into a, a combined operation with officers who all had, from down south and, uh, and Northern Ireland, uh, access to body-worn video. So we got that in at pace. We then required a, uh, an outline business case in 2022 and a full business case in 2023. So this hasn't been going on for years. This has been going on for, since 2021. Uh, and uh, we haven't had body-worn video for 10 years, and I think that's an extraordinary omission, uh, frankly. For these, for these two reasons, it's the best research evidence that body-worn video reduces uh, harm to police officers by about 20%, uh, which is a welfare issue, and complaints from the public by about 20% to another welfare issue. So given everything else, I'm very keen on it. I think there's some optimism bias about what we have been told through the, through the committee, but I am pretty confident now because I asked the senior responsible officer to write directly to me two months ago outlining his confidence on this area that spring 2025 will see the start of the rollout. And the frustration has been, I think within policing too, is the, uh, uh, the interdependencies were underestimated mm -hmm. in terms of body warmth. Buying the kit, as the chief constable said, that's very straightforward, just buy the kit. Or they have to procure it under Scottish government procurement rules. It's not that straightforward. You then have to link it with desk, the digital evidence, which is innovative. 
But most importantly, you have to have the infrastructure in Scotland to do this. You have to have the pipe work going into all these police stations at the right bandwidth. And that is also a, quite a challenge. You, and Police Scotland are having to create the infrastructure for this. I think that might have been taken by the Scottish Government as an infrastructure <coughs> programme, but it hasn't been. And find the permissions across all these local authorities of digging up and, and putting the right infrastructure. I am confident they're doing it as fast as they can do. I am as confident as I can be for them with the written requirements I have. It's spring of 2025. It will be a complete game changer uh, in policing. I, I'm really convinced about that. Um, my, my own optimism is I know I've spoken to everybody engaged, Chief Constable Down, uh, they are so committed to this. They so see what happened. Uh, and uh, if you ask the former Deputy Chief Constable Will Kerr about this, he at the time said it was an embarrassment. And I think that's the strongest endorsement for how the authority feels. It's been an embarrassment not to have it. That's what the Chief, that Deputy Chief Constable said. And we're going to drive this as quickly, as fast as we can do as an oversight body. I am finally just aware, if I drive it too fast, I'm aware that infrastructure and IT programmes can be delivered badly if they're delivered too fast. So I want it delivered well. And uh, what is extraordinary about the desk project, which we'll get through uh, and we'll get uh, video in through this system, is the early guilty pleas mm -hmm. going into the court system. That will reduce what the Chief Constable is talking about, the number of police officers required to attend uh, and they're not actually called. You get early guilty pleas through body-worn video, through desk. You have a virtual circle of reducing the waiting time for courts and you have the ability to deal with the criminality much more quickly. I think it's something we're all keen to see get rolled out as quickly as possible. Um, in your written submission, you say that you require at least an increased capital investment of £83 million to deliver the basic rolling replacement programme of fleet systems and policing equipment. Can you provide some further details of what it would mean should this increased funding be available? Be available. Mm -hmm. Can I turn to the... Uh, for, for detail to the account. Yeah, I'm just looking at the, the bit that I've got in the role of replacement. It includes a lot of safety things as well. It's got a uh, body armour, firearms supporting taser capability. Um, it's also got forensic services replacement. So there's a lot of things. So what but there's a lot of things in there. And what you'll note in the profiling, we haven't overbid for this financial year mm -hmm. on the states because uh, for the next financial year because it's a, a programme you have to gear up for. So it's uh, lower. Mm -hmm. 22 million for next financial year, then rises to 65 million. But the chief, sorry, I, I, yeah. if you can just go through those, those ma major areas. Well, I don't think it's in our submission. It might be in the Police Scotland submission, the detail. Right. Um, and we support that. Mm -hmm. um, how the, the budget is, um, uh, how the ask, not the budget, apologies, how the ask is um, articulated and agreed is, is very much um, a joint task between ourselves. Um, and um, Police Scotland with, with us challenging that as we go along and what's in that paper, as I understand it, Ms Dye, is um, what we support that. So that's, that's what it would look like in 25-26. Um, in right, OK. And just a quick one on forensic services. And I think this is your submission yeah. that I'm reading now. Um, it said about the prevalence of drug driving in Scotland is a significant concern for policing and has far exceeded predictions when the legislation was introduced. Um, so I would imagine that means there's much more cost with it, which maybe ties in with what Liam Kerr's question was at the earlier panel on whether we're actually um, budgeting properly in legislation yeah. for what the actual cost is when it, when it goes live. So um, could you maybe tell us a bit more about the demand on that and also... It says that there's an impact in the demand for the drug, drug driving toxicology services. So I'm just wondering, are you easily able to recruit for those positions or is there any skills gap? Uh, thank you very much for the, for the question. Um, it, it has been a, a significant journey that Forensic Services and Police Scotland have been on since the legislation was introduced in 2019 in relation to drug driving. Uh, the prevalence of driving on the roads of Scotland under the influence of drugs is far higher than was anticipated. And uh, without robust testing across the whole of the country at the level required, uh, we don't know what the prevalence of, of drug driving is at this point in time. We work very closely with Police Scotland colleagues uh, to look at what we expect 
the demand for toxicology analysis to grow to, and it's at least eight times more, than, more testing than what we are currently able to progress within the laboratory. So there's a lot of, uh, of work that needs to be uh, done to make sure that we grow capacity uh, to be able to undertake that complex analysis. Mm -hmm. It is quite challenging to recruit uh, into this area. Uh, toxicologists are in short supply across the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, so we very much have to train uh, staff and that, that does take some time. Uh, so it's important that we grow the capacity that we have sufficient uh, technology and automated systems to allow us to be able to work with Police Scotland to deal with this really complex problem. So is that something that you can train in-house or do you need to go to college courses, university courses? or? We train primarily in-house. However, there needs to be the educational basis upon which uh, uh, somebody can be successful through that training. So we do recruit from universities um, uh, and people that have gone through appropriate academic courses and obtained qualifications. That's the basis upon which we then train toxicologists within a forensic context. And I'm assuming that when the legislation came in, there was a budgetary cost for that. So you're saying it's eight times more was there ever any increase in the budget for it when we realised it was much more prevalent than we thought? So Scottish Government have uh, invested an additional £2.2 .2 million uh, into the toxicology testing uh, since the legislation was introduced uh, and the original investment that was made to create laboratory capacity at that time. So we have more than doubled the internal cap capability that we have, uh, as well as supplementing that by um, sending some samples through an outsource external provider in England uh, to supplement some of that analysis. So the eightfold increase really looks at uh, the ability to roll out roadside testing to Police Scotland officers more broadly across the country. Uh, and then we need the laboratory uh, analysis capacity to be able to uh, pr provide the evidential samples for court purposes. Okay, thank you. Can I just clarify, in our submission, there isn't the budget ask to meet the eight times. Mm -hmm. um, we're asking, I'm asking uh, Fiona Douglas to build the case with the Scottish Government about what that would mean, how much that would cost, and it'll be in the budgetary profile for the year after this. So th that is an extraordinary number, eight times that's going on. And the important thing to emphasise, unless it gets missed, is that we have an artificial cap on what comes into forensic services, which is roadside testing. It's only through uh, uh, roads policing that you get into a testing on this area of driving under the influence of drugs. Mm -hmm. And that, if that cap was lifted, the demand would be greater than we could supply, but it's, it's uh, Fiona's job to make the case, clarify what the cost is, explain to the my my committee on this why we're going to do it in-house rather than contracting it to do out-house what mm -hmm. the differences are and then discuss it with our scottish government government colleagues about whether that's um whether that's a priority for them and uh, fiona was talking to me about this uh, yesterday about the uh, average cost of a drugs related death on the roads and i wonder if you could just repeat that number because you're more familiar than i am uh, yes, certainly. The, um, so the traffic, uh, Transport Scotland have indicated that the cost to the public purse of uh, fatality on the roads in Scotland is uh, 2.6, in excess of 2.6 million. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. I wonder if I can just come in with a couple of quick supplementaries, just on the 2.2 million, which you've obviously um, set out as being um, additional funding that the um, Scottish Government has provided. Has that proved to be sort of adequate for the sort of immediate kind of pressure that toxicology services has been under? What, what, it us, what it has allowed us to do is to uh, meet the capacity internally, uh, the, the, the demand for the roadside police uh, testing. So the roadside police officers will undertake the testing mm -hmm. and it allows us to be able to service that demand. Okay, and, and you also, just out of interest, you, you spoke about outsourcing services um, elsewhere. In an ideal world, would you prefer not to have to do that if you had the sort of capacity in-house, so to speak? Uh, yes, I think we've, we will look at um, and cost out in detail the options um, for a long-term sustainable model mm -hmm. for drug driving toxicology analysis, but the preference would be to build the in-house capacity 
Uh, there are a lot of factors outside of our control in terms of the availability of uh, capacity in the broader forensic science mm -hmm. marketplace in England and Wales. Mm -hmm. And just one final, if I, if I may, um, jumping in, but we spoke a, a, a bit earlier um, with Police Scotland about you know, innovation, technology, um, and um, sort of the digitising aspect of a lot of, sort of police um, service delivery. It, I would imagine in the world of forensics that's quite relevant as well, and, and, and there's advancements all the time. It, are those costs um, factored in um, to your sort of budget considerations for the SPA as opposed to Police Scotland? Uh, so we do use automated um, mm -hmm. technology and processes where we're able, particularly around DNA profiling, yeah. is a really good example of that. Um, as we develop uh, the business case for investment in further toxicology analysis to support drug driving, there is the need for us to look at automated systems that improve the capacity that's available within the laboratory. We have to consistently innovate uh, and use new technology to stay ahead um, of criminals um, within the country. So we have to make sure we are using and supplying Police Scotland with the tools and techniques from a forensic mm -hmm. science perspective that they need. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the costs of um, replacing our capital are included within um, the, the, the budget asks um, within the, the, the overall uh, request um, that, that, that has been submitted. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, capital equipment through the, through the tech, uh, often desktop based, are between mm -hmm. 800,000 and a million pounds for these really complicated uh, machines to analyse. The next stages will be what the, what the authority is interested in is use of AI yeah. within the control of a scientist to help with some of the mundane written reporting that is required. This is also going to be coming through. So the beneficial idea of machine learning is you can pre populate standard uh, reports from the analysis without having to go pen and paper. Yeah. So I think the future is very much uh, about machine learning within yeah. the uh, forensic sciences. They already are incredibly well placed in terms of technology. Brian Plasto, the uh, Biometrics Commissioner, said that it's uh, world leading in terms of their DNA mm -hmm. testing. Mm -hmm. We want it to get far more efficient and more, far more effective in terms of the turnaround and the engagement and use our scientists. We have 500 scientists and staff working in the SPA separate from the police, providing a sterile corridor from crime scene to court. I think they're unique in uh, the United Kingdom. For the most part, that's privatised systems. Uh, in, uh, in, in England and Wales. And I would like, in, uh, in answer to your earlier question, to keep a public uh, uh, forensic services. It's extremely valuable, not least on occasion with the extraordinary efforts they make on cold casing, cases which you would not be able to pay for with an open-ended cheque in a private lab. That mm -hmm. can be done for the commitment of a public service. Mm -hmm. And there's been some fantastic examples of cold case uh, um, for findings from a, the de dedicated scientists and forensic services brought people to justice after 30 or 40 years. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Really interesting. Okay, I'll bring in Pauline McNeill. Um, the next question. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Martin, um, I agree with Will Kerr, who said it's an embarrassment to Scotland that we don't have the full rollout of body worn cameras, but you know, as you outlined to the committee, there's a lot more to consider than simply the equipment itself. It's the infrastructure that goes um, with it. I um, honestly thought you were going to say to Sharon Dowie that it would be complete by May 25, but you said it's only going to begin in 25. Can you give the committee some indication of what that means? Is it numbers? Is it hundreds? of officers will have body-worn cameras. Is is there a kind of... Could we follow a timeline here in any way so we can see like what the planned rollout looks like? Is it 200, 300? The commitment I have, could I ask this written question within internally from the senior responsible officer and discussed it with the chief constable, is that um, the rollout of 10,500 frontline officers will take 12 months. So right. the time scale is from the time you start, it will take 12 months 12 to get months. to those critical right. areas. And I, if I can make this point, we haven't had it for a decade. And I think that is to the great 
embarrassment of policing in Scotland. But we're going to have it uh, within the next 18 mm -hmm. months or so. That's the prize I want. And I'm aware, as you are aware of committees, that big infrastructure projects can fail at implementation yeah. if you try them in the wrong way. I want this, when it works, to work first time. And I want it to work first time in each of the divisions it's rolled out to. And I want it to work as it gets transferred through the electronic mechanism into the courts to, uh, to provide police officers with greater protection and the public uh, with greater certainty in terms of the outcomes of justice. Those are worth waiting for, in my view, for weeks and months. That, so that's so I'm frustrated by it, but mm -hmm. my, my, my evidence to you is within yeah. 12 months, 10,500 cops will have it yeah. uh, by, the, by spring 2026. Yes, so. a point well made. There's no point, and after all this time, not ruling it out properly and to, to make sure that minimise any um, issues that arise. Uh, thank you for that. I just had one other question, um, which is just to... Um, you said, in answer to one of the members, that Wales has a higher per capita... England and Wales. Is, is that and for... Ca police, for for budget, for police budget? For the capital spend in England, average capital spend from a police authority, a police service in England and Wales is 1.4 times higher. So for every pound that we might have, they got one pound forty. That's quite an extraordinary difference, and that comes from the, uh, from the evidence I think of the police mm -hmm. productivity review undertaken in England and Wales. It just shows we're behind the curve on this one, and I tried to make the case to bring us up just to slightly less than their average would take a fantastic investment, two hundred million pound over ten years. And my job as a chair is to find the pathway to that investment. Part of it, part of it is to make the asks of things which are beyond my ability to organise, fiscal framework, but they're also part of it to identify the cost, show what we can do properly, show the benefits to the police officers and the public, and actually have a credible investment campaign, particularly in the states. I think we've only just arrived at that position now. Mm -hmm. So the channels then, if you like, to change that would be through to the Scottish Government, to the UK Government? Is that yes, well, I think well, there's two things. We don't know what the Chancellor's going to say about changing the fiscal framework in terms mm -hmm. of borrowing. I'm optimistic about that. Might, that might say something that might be consequential. So that's, again, beyond my... I don't know, beyond my... But we're, we're doing it in small steps. The thing for me as a Chair of the Authority, is it a credible ask, the capital ask? I think it is. Uh, can we pay for it ourselves if we were allowed to borrow? Yep, we apparently can do. Do we have the power to borrow? We definitely have the power to borrow. It's subject to ministerial approval. And then there's the cap on borrowing, which is the existential problem, I think, that uh, Mr McPherson sorted out. That is mm -hmm. not something resolvable within the Scottish authorising environment. All we can do is bring to you the ambition we'd have for change in terms of particularly estates and say, to you, and say to you, we are confident we can, we can pay the capital back and the interest back under the public sector, public services loans board, so that within those, ability to borrow cheaper, uh, mm -hmm. which local government have. I, I do think there's going to be a big issue uh, in, in, in terms of the strategic approach to policing, because without that investment, we're going to carry on you telling us how... you. Officers, and we know that, are, are having to work in intolerable con mm -hmm. conditions and we'll carry on saying we can't do very much about that. We have mm -hmm. what we rather strangely call regret spend, uh, which should be putting a lot of money in to maintaining a really poor building, which is very inefficient. And that takes a lot of money to stand still and probably go back a little. So the capital investment is critical for this. For this, for this budget, the capital investment programme is probably the biggest systematic change we're seeking. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's noted because I think the committee are well aware of the um, relationship between um, poor, poorly maintained buildings, poor environments and, and mental health um, and a whole lot of other um, relationships in relation to not having the modernisation. The one that Sharon Dowie raised as well, um, closing police offices um, saves in one sense, but communities... And police officers themselves get concerned about being out of operation while they go much further and back. So, yes, it's, 
It's, it's well noted and a point well made. I think it also has an impact on public confidence. What your visible service looks like is how people think it's, it's dealt with. 87% of people have no crime committed against them from one year to the next. So their impression of policing is about what policing looks like. Officers on the street and the buildings they occupy. I think the buildings they occupy, uh, you know, are, are, some of them are, uh, as I would say, in body worn video, an embarrassment to, to the public, to a public service. And we can do something about that by the careful, considered, uh, and affordable investment in it. And uh, if if caps can be lifted, uh, fiscal caps can be lifted, I'd be I'd be absolutely delighted. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I think Rona Mackay, did you want to come in with a follow-up? I, I do, just a, a, a brief point, and it um, relates back to body worn cameras in the earlier um, conversation. And I may have misheard this, so apologies if I did. You talked about COP26 and how it was an embarrassment that, that our officers didn't... Did, did you say that you got them in at pace? Yes. Right, so I'm trying to square that in my head, that you could do that for that, but we still don't have them for the rest of the force. Is that a well, different yeah. well, scenario? Yeah, well, doing it at pace for Glasgow, which is the way they're broadly, yeah. you know, for 400 officers yeah. uh, in the infrastructure in Glasgow is far different from the huge... Uh, geographic yeah. nature of, yeah. of I just, Scotland. Yeah, that, I, I thought that would probably yeah. be the case, which is still very interesting that that was able to be done, albeit on a much smaller scale. And the other thing is that we didn't have to link it to uh, the digital system to transfer that data directly into uh, the fiscal service and uh -huh, to defence lawyers as well. Uh -huh. So that's another piece mm -hmm. of the machinery that's still being developed. Uh, you know, we're, still, we're trying to do this with different different aspects of the relationships, the dependencies, as they're called to me, mm -hmm. all in flux. Um, so it can be done. It was mm -hmm. done. Delighted mm -hmm. it was done. Mm -hmm. But you can't, we can't uh, times that uh, okay. because of this huge numbers and the mm -hmm. geographic spread. Sure. OK, thank you. Thanks, Kavira. OK, thank you. I wonder if I can just um, come in on uh, an issue that we spoke about in the previous panel, and, and that was about sort of, I suppose, inefficiencies across the criminal justice system that impact um, on um, police staffing and, and, and budgets. And we, I think we spoke about that in the context of court time. Um, so I just wondered um, about the, the work that, in addition to the work that Police Scotland is doing with other parts of the sector. From from your perspective, um, I'm interested in a wee bit more detail about how you're supporting that sort of effort to try and pull out these inefficiencies, whether it's in respect of court time or, or other um, challenges. Well, I'll, I'll talk about the biggest inefficiency that I was driving three years ago, supported by this committee, which was dealing with mental health. And it wasn't that police officers were not supposed to deal with mental health. I really feel proud of the way they respond to calls for service. What was the real problem was no handover. You got there, you assessed it, a, a police officer made an assessment, and they had to stay with that person, partly because they were concerned that if they left them, there might be a penalty to that, and partly because there's nobody to hand over mm -hmm. to. And I have just a couple of months ago visited Lanarkshire to look at their community triage system, an extraordinary measure of cooperation between the NHS and police service, which is person-centred, and it's not about saving police officers' time, it's providing the best service to somebody with mental health distress, and it stopped visits to mental health to, to A&E, about 2,000 of them, it gave people within an hour uh, an assessment, a mental health ses assessment, so they feel far better serviced. So I would say one of the efficiencies is to find ways of actually providing better services to people rather than just looking at police officer efficiency. That's not the lens that the authority would look, 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 look through. In the bigger case about court, court systems, uh, we are members of the uh, Criminal Justice Board, which is a board of all people in there, in, in dealing with the whole criminal justice system. I would say, and I'll pass on to Lynn Brown here, I undertook a review of legal aid uh, several 2017 for the Scottish Government and uh, looking at criminal legal aid in, uh, in court and I found there were three groups who weren't taken very much notice of in the order of uh, court business, defence solicitors, police officers and witnesses. They all had a, a lot of time hanging around. They had uh, calls to be in, in court which were then not actually having their hearing uh, und undertaking. So, I don't know what's, it, what's happened since then, but that was my broad impression all those years ago. I think, as the Chief Counsel said, this is a partnership issue. I think there's lots of things trying to happen. The case management system 
Going back to body worn video, the idea that people and desk people are pleading guilty earlier mm -hmm. is a great benefit to police officers. You don't have to turn up when there's a guilty plea. So the, the, the stars are starting to align on the efficiencies. But can I just hand over to the chief executive who's more detailed on this? Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Chair. So the um, Criminal Justice Board is just made up of all partners in the justice system, and it's chaired um, by um, the two directors, one on the police side and one on the justice side. And they've got a, a delivery programme for uh, delivering on efficiencies. Um, and some of these aspects we've touched on today are in that. I think that is a, a crucial forum. I think, um, I don't know whether it's particularly well known what they're doing. I think this committee would be a really uh, helpful way to, to maybe surface what um, the plans are. Mm -hmm. My view is it seems... It's, it seems a number of work streams rather than a, an overall driving it forward. Um, so there is that programme. They are making progress. Some of what you've heard today is part of that programme. And it may be that the committee would want to hear more mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, th thank you for that. I think Ben McPherson, you want to come in with that? So. Thanks. Just in the, the, the same area of, of consideration, does the, has the Criminal Justice Board discussed the possibility of utilising video technology when either taking expert witness statements or statements from police officers and doing so either live or recorded. Uh, these are matters that this committee in its previous uh, incarnation spoke about with witnesses in the last parliamentary term. And just in the same way that uh, body-worn video cameras could capture evidence that is is able to be utilised efficiently. Surely, particularly after the pandemic, there's more that can be done across the system to reduce the amount of time that different stakeholders are having to uh, waste effectively hanging around. Should I? Yeah, in terms of that level of detail, um, I can't confirm, but I do know there is a digital aspect to everything that they're doing. And part of the Justice Board is looking at post-COVID. Things changed virtually overnight during COVID. Things that um, thought were would take years to do happened very quickly because of necessity. So that, there is that mindset to do different things. Um, I think it might be worth, you know... Um, uh, we could come back to you with some more information on our view of what's in there, but I think you'd probably need the, the whoever chairs the Justice Board to brief you on all of that. And, and the Crown, I presume. Um, yes, everyone at the Crown. Um, yes, it's, I mean, it's all Justice Board partners. So you've got the Crown agent, you've got the Chief Executive of the tri Court and Tribunals, you've got, uh, you've got the deputies uh, from uh, Police Scotland, you've got the Police Authority, you've got Legal Aid, you've got, you've got a whole range... Um, uh, community safety, a whole range um, of um, uh, anyone who's in the criminal justice side of things are on that board at chief exec level. I mean, I don't underestimate the logistical challenge mm -hmm. of, of timetabling and scheduling yeah. and organising trials and making sure that's a thorough and appropriate mm -hmm. process, but it does seem that there's a lot that could be saved yeah. uh, if we, if we could utilise technology more. Sorry, Chair, I don't know if you... Sir, may, may I just add? Um, one of the benefits of, of, of Scotland itself and that the, the, the how we're set up is that all those justice partners can get in a room um, together and discuss how they can be innovative, and that's what they're trying to do. I think that is our advantage. We're small, so it's our disadvantage that we tend to, uh, to find the difficulties rather than the, where we can coalesce around. The point I would make is a bigger point, uh, if I could do. Since 2010, there have been four strategic defence reviews in the United Kingdom. There's never been a strategic policing review. And I think what we miss is that kind of strategic oversight. There are five other police services who actually deliver policing services in Scotland to Police Scotland or to the people of Scotland. So in order to get this best value, to look at the whole system, from a policing perspective, some strategic oversight in insight would be absolutely fantastic because the pathway into the court system, how people are diverted from the court system, how people don't churn up our prisons, 
Uh, all these things are within the remit of a strategic policing review. And my frustration as the chair of the policing authority is that I don't really have the ability to get and encourage this bigger picture. And I think that picture should be across more, more wider than Police Scotland. We've got British Transport Police, uh, you know, the uh, Civil Nuclear Police, you've got the Military Police, they're all operating in Scotland. We were visiting the NCA two weeks ago, looking at their extraordinary capability and capacity to impact on fraud and drugs in Scotland. And uh, we know that a huge amount of fraud is taking place by perpetrators living outside Europe, let alone uh, the United Kingdom. So I think some of these big picture issues, which we, we start with in the criminal justice system, may, may be we have a more strategic view about the role of policing uh, in keeping us safe in modern policing and the multiple agencies. Because one of the things that uh, I do see uh, very regularly over my, my time in policing and elsewhere is actually the policy silos. We all talk about it, but uh, in keeping people safe, there's a whole range of agencies to be involved, including the criminal justice system. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I wonder if I could, can just bring the session to a close with a final question. Um, and again, it's coming back to capital budget. Um, last year, um, I think it was in, in the same panel last year with yourselves, um, there was reference to planned slippage uh, in terms of um, managing the capital programme, if you like, so um, essentially allocating more money than is available, but assuming that there would be slippage uh, on the, uh, at, at some point. I'm just wondering if you can maybe update us on if that's a practice that is still relied on? Um, what are your views on it? Is it something that um, is sustainable going forward? Let me just give you the big picture. Uh, slippage is a, is a result of actually having annuality. So what you do is you over you overcommit your capital in that year knowing some of it won't be spent uh, and in order that you may be able to spend 100% of your capital. Because in the past, what we've done is committed 100% and found we can't spend eight, we can, can't spend 10 or 15. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the uh, slippage or the overcommitment is as a result of, uh, of a risk approach by our, uh, our resources commission to encourage policing to, to, to do this in order that we actually spend the capital. The profiling of that spend tends to end up being towards the end of the year mm -hmm. rather than spread over the year, and that's another very, very significant risk because you can't spell cap spend capital quickly. So that's another annuality issue. So profiling is important. So we have encouraged uh, through the committee more risk-taking in this area, it, proportionate and reasonable risk-taking in this area to spend the capital uh, in order that it's effectively spent. Because if you don't do that, what we do is you come to the end of the year in the public service and you're, you're looking around, what can you spend a large amount of money in within a month or two? And then that is not good value, not best mm -hmm. value at all. And that's what we're trying to avoid. Mm -hmm. But our lead on this is our accountable officer who is very strong on this area. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, convener, um, yes, um, the accounts for 23-24 will show capital was spent as allocated. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, that is because they have that uh, slippage and um, bias mm -hmm. built in. Because quite often in capital, as you'll appreciate, it's design work. It's not the actual build as well. And you, you can't do that in one year quite often. So that has been successful. In the current year, 24-25, we were running into some difficulties because of the... Um, the, the, the approvals that were put in place by Scottish Government in terms of approving, you had to go back and get what was called accountable officer template approval. Um, but I wrote to the Scottish um, Government pointing out the difficulties that was giving mm -hmm. uh, Police Scotland operational terms, and, and they, did, they did respond to that and give us a blanket approval to go forward. Okay. So they, they did respond very well. So it's still built in there. It's closely monitored. The Resources Committee, as Mr Evans says, is very much attuned to it and monitors mm -hmm. it. Our concern this year was that it was going too slow um, and we have been able to turn that around, hopefully, by the year end. Mm -hmm. So I think what you're saying is it is a practice that, can, that has a place in mm -hmm. overall budgeting practice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. OK, thank you. more of a place when you've got annuality. Yeah. If you could take spend over more than one financial year, you had reserves, mm -hmm. you'd be able to make these decisions in the, in the face of what you actually needed to spend it on with annuality. 
if you're coming towards the end of the year and you haven't spent the money, you either kind of put it back, and as I sort of said, it goes back, you know, into the public purse, or you have to spend it, and it's inefficient to spend it very quickly on things which are not a priority for policing on the annuality basis. Okay, thank you. And my apologies, I omitted to bring our new deputy convener in for a final question, so I'll do that now. I'm very grateful, Martin Evans. It's just uh, something that I put to the Chief Constable earlier uh, that I'd like to hear your thoughts on. So you'll have seen in Police Scotland's submission that they raised that the financial implications of current legislation are significantly higher than they are able to absorb in business as usual. Do you know whether those financial implications were adequately predicted in the financial memorandum at the time, or did Parliament pass legislation without fully appreciating, or perhaps understanding, the financial implications of that legislation on Police Scotland? I think the evidence is on occasion absolutely did. I think the drug driving is a classic example where the prevalence of drunk, drug driving was estimated at a certain level and then found to be far in excess of that uh, uh, when it came to implementation. And therefore, we had to have uh, systems in place to reduce the demands on the forensic services by, by that. On other areas, I'm, I'm sure it is also not well, not well evidenced because how can the difficulty is evidencing the future of a piece of legislation because you don't know what, what, what's going to happen within it uh, in, in, in those areas. Generally, I think we are concerned about the estimates uh, within financial memorandum. And again, I'm going to bring in our accountant officer because I've had conversations with the Crown Office and with the Chief Constable about this to find ways of better predicting what, what's going to happen and better aligning. The other thing to say is, again, the, the accountant officer is very, keen on, uh, very good on this, is to say... Not every, not every cost is an extra cost to policing. So we are trying to identify within this ask the additional cost and then the business as usual cost. Those are quite distinct costs. So it's additional costs we're interested in uh, for, for, for some of this legislation. So short answer is I don't think it's, I think it's imperfect. Sometimes it's been wildly inaccurate. I think we're trying to work uh, with, with our partners to actually have our input earlier on rather than to receive the financial memorandum to be actually part of the discussions about what that might be. You've been involved in some of those. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I would say that, um, and it was mentioned in the Chief Constable's session, that there's a much more robust approach to quantifying the cost of legislation, um, particularly over the last 18 months. Um, that Part of that came out from the issues that arose through the drug driving, um, and also there was an issue I know around the what I call the ethics bill in terms of the costs of that. I know there were some difficult, I think it was finance committee meetings on that. Um, and so we, we decided that, um, when I say we, the police authority with Police Scotland, to have a much more robust um, look at um, the spend. I am very clear it should be additional spend. Um, you will hear a lot about opportunity cost. Um, and that is, you know, the opportunity of maybe doing something else, but it's not additional cost. And my view is that lessons have been learned um, and that what comes forward should be much more robust and it should be additional to the public purse. Very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. OK, um, I think that's us up to time, so I'm going to close this panel. Before I suspend the meeting, though, I would like to thank Martin for your contribution to the committee. I know that retirement calls, not imminently, um, but um, I think perhaps at the turn of the year, uh, and so this may well be your final uh, appearance at the committee. So uh, we're very grateful for the contributions that you have made um, throughout the period of the committee this session, uh, and would, uh, I think on behalf of the committee members, like to wish you well in your retirement and whatever you do uh, during your retirement, which I'm sure won't just be sitting around. So thank you very much for your, uh, th much. For your service, and I'll suspend the meeting briefly. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, <clears throat> members. So our next item uh, of business is to consider a letter that we received from the convener of the Constitution, Europe, External Affairs and Culture Committee, uh, and I refer members to paper three. So I just want to check with members if you have any comments that you wish to make on the content of the paper and the um, attached letter from the convener. If not, can I ask members uh, if you are agreed that we should write to the Scottish Government asking uh, them about their intentions in light of the new EURA Directive on anti-trafficking measures. Are members content with that proposal? Agreed. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so that completes our business uh, in public today and we now move into private session. Thank you.